everybody. I just realized the screen isn't on too. Oh, we're having technical difficulties today. It's our 10th episode, so everything's gone sideways. You know, I don't know why. Harrison, can you go and fix my screen, please? I can't see that far away. Welcome, anyway, to episode Hi, 10. Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. Yay, we're here at Clutter Gallery in Beacon, New York. Still breathing. Still doing it with CZ13. Well, my snack is here in, in Beacon, New York. And then CZ13 is all the way over in England. Thanks, Harrison. Yeah. yeah. How's everyone doing? Good. You had a good week? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Been busy. Pump kidding it up. We got the show on the 29th. So. so some of these available to add to your Halloween collection. We are going to have... Uh, Yay, real... somebody came over from Instagram. Welcome, Say. Yes. Thank you for coming uh, over. Yes, and what's up, Droldin? Yay, hello, <coughs> everybody. Welcome. Um, for the Pump Kid show on the 29th, Lost Farmer's going to be here with lots of beer. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. No, you have to excited. come dressed up in costume because it is a costume party. Or as I like to say, fancy dress. But don't come in a suit. When Lost Farmer asked you today what kind of costume party it was creepy or cute oh. you said i don't know <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's halloween okay it is so, fancy dress isn't it that's what you said yeah, fancy, it's dress. fancy dress when we hear what's up hey, Corey? Corey? welcome um when when i hear fancy as an american i hear like a tuxedo Right, like a penguin suit or something. Yeah, yeah. This is one of those memos. There's a guy on YouTube who like is called like Notes Across the Pond, and he's always like the whole point is what memos didn't get passed back and forth. So maybe I should like, Frank, what's up, Frank? Hello, Frank. I should, I'm gonna DM I'm gonna coffee. go like DM him or something and be like, do fancy dress because I don't think he's done that one. And swimming yeah. costumes. Yeah, I'm swimming totally totally backwards too. They say swimming costume instead of swimsuit. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's weird. So it's just like flipped back and forth. That's weird. Are we going to talk about Liz Truss? No. Is this that kind of show? No. No, no this is a show about, about, it. show about toys. Because <coughs> uh, if, uh, if we're dressing up for this thing, I'm literally getting a vasectomy the day before this. And so I might just be pale. I'm going to be walking in. Okay, like, wait, wait, I we, wait, can we decide Please. what your actual costume is? I was going to say you could go yeah, come to the so you should come as a giant bag of frozen peas. Oh, man. What, I'm just going to be a wheelchair. In a wheelchair. Or, <laughs> or you could, do I need a wheelchair? Can I, like, walk around when I got that fucking snip? You could get, like, uh, some sort of, like, no. tube <laughs> with a slice and blood dripping and be your severed vas deferens. You're definitely oh not God. supposed to be walking around. Am I not supposed yeah. to be walking no, around? No, walking around's okay, right? You just can't lift anything? Is that what they said? I don't remember. You lift a fucking ball sack, I'll tell you what. That's going to be <laughs> <laughs> well, It's easy. So you haven't been snipped, right? No, nah, so no. Nah. You might, you yeah, might wind nah. up... You're waiting for, you know, the opportunity to maybe... I will say dressing room. Apparently you don't baby. like the word you know, gown. The that's true. Dressing gown. Yeah, Miranda, that's true. Miranda, that's true. Oh, you call we it, say dressing gown. You call you it dressing don't. gown? You say robe. But what do you call the thing that you wear at night? What? You put on, in the morning you put on a dressing gown. Is, that is what you do call yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is that what you tell Rebel to call it too? You tell our five year old go put on your dressing gown? Or you say no, put on your robe? No, I tell him to put on his robe. You're like you're you're like you're uh, uh, <laughs> continent appropriate with him or like nation specific. Sometimes it depends what we're talking yeah. about though. Yeah. We should so, start yeah, bringing have... it up and confuse him. Just go, look, put your dressing gown on. And he'll be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? <laughs> the fuck is my dressing gown? He'll get really gown? upset because he won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he'll put and on he a dress, to... won't he? A dress, Tim Cow? A dress? He will. Oh. He will. Hello, What's everybody. Up, Thanks. Wow, got some Thank really, you, really everybody, awesome for joining join. us. Please like and Danger subscribe Bot. and Hold do on. all the YouTube things. Wait, can we just give Dangerbot a hard time? Because, sure? yeah, Dangerbot, you haven't returned my email. I've told him to call you about and then 12 times. she was like, I owe him an email. So, Danger about you and me, we got an email like, tomorrow. Yeah, we need to get on a call. Let's do this. Let's make some shit happen. Um, so, 29th, Pump Kid Custom Show. I should have bought some of them out, but I thought I'd save that for next week. Oh, but next week's show is on Friday. Alex, you could show a couple over there in the back room. Yeah, yeah. Want me to? Yeah, sneak a couple. Yeah. Sneak, sneak an evil Dave and a, I know, MP Galthrunch just came in. Oh, so yeah, let's okay. sneak some of the customs because next week's show will be after 
Mm. Oh no, I said we before. We're doing five know. points. Time, five points fast virtual crazy. is Wednesday and Thursday. We're gonna be on all day on network. Right, and then Friday is James Groman live on Clutter Live. And Not dead on Clutter Live. No, live on Clutter Live, and then We're live on Clutter Live. Then it's the party. And then the next day is the party. So it's like we've got like, four days. Like you were saying earlier, send me a fucking schedule email or something. Like yeah, we okay. will. And then um, I also got this this notice uh, that November fourth and fifth is bonfire night in Beacon, and like Americans, I don't know totally if they put it together. They've totally well, no. The the people who are running bonfire night in Beacon know about they do bonfire night, but they've they're trying to. They know that no one in America knows what bonfire night is and actually if you try and explain bonfire night to americans <laughs> it's yeah. kind of kind of racist or like it's not woke because you're killing a terrorist you're like celebrating the death of a terrorist and that's sort of like kind of fucked up so they're not talking about what a guy fox they're saying it's somehow tied to like yeah, a fire that happened the on the mountain a hundred years ago. Yeah, but they're doing, they're doing it on the fourth. They're doing it on the fourth and Which the fifth. Not, yeah. Oh, they are. They're doing it on the fourth and the fifth. So now it's like two nights of nonsense. Which it's we're gonna do. I don't know. We're gonna I be. Think it's gonna be a music. It's a firework night, isn't it? It's firework night. Yeah. Yeah. I know Americans totally missing the point about Guy Fox and. You know, yeah, like all that. they're not gonna start wheeling around. Can you imagine if guy. we had well it would, for us it would be like if we were wheeling around Osama bin Laden and being like, Yay, like did. Really Guy Fawkes did try to blow up Parliament in England. Yes. And in England you dre you make a guy. I don't know if anybody still bothers to do this anymore, but when I was a kid, it was still tradition to make a guy out of things that you could burn and then wheel him around the neighborhood in a wheelbarrow and <clears> collect <throat> money. Are people right? still doing that? No. Easily? You throw no. pennies into the no, wheel. No penny for the guy. Yeah, and you'd go around and you'd say penny for the guy, and yeah. people would throw pennies in, and then you would take it to the local giant bonfire oh. and throw the guy on the bonfire and burn him. Well, yeah. I do remember. I do remember when I was little, and we'd go to the bonfire somewhere, whether it was a big one. It was really like it was fun seeing this like dude in the fire, and it was like, oh, when's yeah. he gonna fall? Because he'd be up the top for ages until like the yeah. fire went down, and then he'd like pff, crash into the uh, yeah. little spot. Do you know what Americans call that? Burning man. Burning man. And they do it in the desert. And they're a bit high. Yeah. Yeah, I lived in the worst part of England for three years. This is a place called Salford. I don't know if anybody in the chat knows about this, but it's really like before now it's kind of a cool place now it's like the bushwick but it's like back in the day it was scary and like i'll tell you what bonfire night in salford was fucking no joke so like well you know. anywhere in england on bonfire night is no joke because you could get a firework shot at you at any second yeah Legit. i used to go, I used oh, to awesome. go up to my beetle and we'd look, pull up in the beetle and then we'd put the window down a bit put exactly. the rocket Giant pole bombs. and um and then like light the rocket out of the side of the beetle as we were going along. Like, well, <laughs> of course you did. You're one of those people. <laughs> God damn it, sees me. <laughs> that's like that's like people here who ruin like teenagers who ruin Halloween by going around and throwing batteries at people or like really egging people and like making it dangerous. Which is And I also also worked in a toy shop, right? And we had the big, big rockets in there. Yeah. And like there was a few faulty ones out the back and I'd get the faulty ones and I'd like hack them open and see what was inside. And there is like a sort of cherry bomb thing in there with a fuse. So then, like, yeah, yeah we just you just light the fuse and like, you Love know, it. <laughs> it like, all the stars that go past it, it was mad. Oh, and wow. Every year there'd be that you know there was a kids show called Blue Peter, and every <laughs> year it was at like five o'clock every okay. night, right, for kids. So you know, was this a pedophile? No, this one wasn't. This okay. is, oh, there was the guy on there that like got busted for doing too much coke. Okay. Like at, like on Blue yeah. Peter or something. So anyway, yeah. they every year would do a thing about not blowing yourself up because every because fireworks are legal. So everybody would just blow themselves up or blow their hands off or whatever. Yeah. Now when when I was in Thanks. third grade, no fifth grade, my best friend let off an M80 in his bathroom and like blew his shoulder open. I was in the hospital What's for two. M80. Days. What's that? An M80 is like a banger. It, it's 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 I believe it's uh, like a portion of a stick of dynamite. It's like so, a third of a stick of dynamite or some shit. Yeah, I don't know what the M80 stands for, but I know it's like right, Alex. It's like some chunk. Yeah. 
Yeah. Stop Every time I this. touch the Stop table, touching it's the table. Oh, don't touch the table. Don't touch the table. Don't touch the table. So the next thing that I really want to talk about, I feel like is going to go on for a while. So I think maybe we should introduce our All right. Can, well, two things first. Okay. Can, oh. just, can we oh, say thank you okay, yeah. to our Toy Tank from So we just got week. this amazing, amazing gift in the mail today. It's our first podcast gift, yes. I think. Am I right yes, to say this, that? For this show, for Clutter Talks, people use to send people stuff to send talk me about. People send me t-shirts because so, I make a yeah. big deal about If you want to send us t-shirts to wear or things to review, please do. We will. We'll talk about them. But oh, thank you. Have I got one? Got one. You haven't got one, no. You have to move here. You can <laughs> if share. you're going to send t-shirts, send like at least one. You can share. You can send at least two, maybe three, maybe four. Though I do have gifts that Creon send for you to send to, to, send to you. Have you got them? I, I do, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you, got... Breadwig. Thank you. Check out his yeah. Kickstarter. And Benny from Tenacious, they were on last week. Uh, they were in our toy tank. Uh, I just want to say about his four eyes, though, because it's genius. So he has four eyes in this sculpt, so that he has two eyes this way, two eyes this way, and two eyes this way. So he's always got two it's eyes looking at, looking at you. It's just great. Cube. It's a cube. Breadwig, we think you should this is make the best this one. dog. Yeah. You should have pulled us. Before you polled your community. Yeah, don't poll the community. Yeah. It's ne it's not always a good and idea. Act, you know, what's interesting about that is that's gonna be a topic that we discussed with James Groman. Oh. Is people wanting to like ask other people who don't love toys what they think about toys. Oh yeah. Yo, that project. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. A that's, good gonna one. Be, that's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting story that we tell with James Groman. So So check out the Kickstarter. But, the link is the thank link you, is Brad, there. It's really great. What's your shirt size? Oh, yeah, please do. He's a large. I'm a large. I'm a small. I'm a... These two are unknown. Now, what size is he? XL. XL. Um, XL. Large XL. Large XL. Me and CZ kind of have the same. Yeah, the same tip. <laughs> but I think they should make this one next. Yeah, yes. great. Do it, Breadwig. I also would like them to be vinyl. I know why they're resin. But... but... but I think that this would be yeah. cool in vinyl. Just plump him up a little bit so his legs are a little thicker. Yeah, just make that engineering decision. You well, know. you know, we have lots of vinyl dogs that look like this guy. Where are they? What kind of dogs? Oh, the, the couch dogs? The dogs up here. No, no but yes. Where sure. are the couch dogs? They're up high. We're not going to get them down right now. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I think I'd like the, the feel of it and the look of it to be resin. I like the resin thing. To be resin? You think it should stay resin? Yeah, I like it, yeah. I touched this, the table. He has little legs, though, so does it's not the same. No, but it's a dog. And and vinyl legs will point. But anyway, so what what is it you're going to talk about? You're going to talk about your t-shirt. I don't know. I want. It, well, it's that's why go I want on, to know. It's going to go on for like it. It's it's a, it's part of talking about my t-shirt. Somebody said if it's resin, I can see that tail breaking off. Yes. Good Absolutely. call, Johnny Dungeons. Right. Good yeah, call. That is a good call. That is yep. that is good an call. issue. That's an issue with resin. Mm -hmm. Is things being Even polished narrow, though. narrow, narrow, narrow. I remember when we first met Frank. Yeah. He just kind of rocked up and was like, "Hey, man, can you fix my resin broken resin figures? They were all polystone. Mm -hmm. That was that was tough, but that's how we met. Yeah. So should we bring on today's guest and we'll I keep think, chatting? I think we should because this is going to get crazy. I think today we have the most stylish of all the street artists, Whew. right? Fashion. He is, yeah. he is the most fashionable and uses the most iconic imagery. And if you've seen his work, you know his work. So without further ado, let's bring on Mr. Peter Van Flores. Woo! Hello, Peter! What's up? Yay, here What's he is. Up? Yeah, I let you down. That was awesome. awesome. Oh, thanks. Thank so. I feel like I let you down now wearing a fancy gown. <laughs> a dressing gown. A dressing so, gown. Man, I'm the most stylish yeah. with wearing a hoodie. Damn, yeah. I, I, first, first question, Peter. It's so yes. awesome to have you. Are you a Smashing Pumpkins fan? So, uh, so I know a couple of their songs and literally like probably two. I don't okay. really know much about like, like rock and all. And pretty much if it's not hip hop, I don't know much about it. I'll be honest. Okay. 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 Barb does with that and for I'm, I'm sure everybody in the art community already knows barb is my better half so she's the one that's always with me yeah yeah we love bob bob's awesome well this you we, want to talk about that weekend we right? went to on friday night we're here to talk about your work 
But, but before that, but I just no, this was I know who you are. So yeah, who's echoing? Who's echo? Echo? I think echo. Peter might have the sound up really loud. Is that the me? Echo is for you. Let's see. Is it me? Is the echo gone, Johnny? What about now? You good? Is that better, Johnny? <laughs> I think it's good. It's okay, resolved. Good. All, All right. right. All right. If All it right. echoes, holler in the chat. All right. Cool. So on Friday night, we went to see Smashing Pumpkins and Jane's Addiction, and I think your take on it was the best take. Like, it was uh, a weird version of Jane's Addiction, mm-hmm. and it was kind of the original. Almost, it, both bands were in similar situations where they were both almost the original lineup. Almost, and we were excited to Jane's Addiction because it was the original lineup. And then yes. Dave Navarro is like, "I have long COVID. I'm out." Which is our take on it is not that he had long COVID; is that they weren't headlining, but. After, anyway. after seeing the show and realizing like like what a short version of Jane's Addiction what a, of a Jane's Addiction concert it was mm-hmm. it was only like eight songs or ten songs it was one hour and they were done and we, I knew it was going to be like a quick show because it was like they did like hit 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 there was no filler songs there was nothing random it was just like boom and we're out and they were amazing except you know the lead guitarist was a uh, not Dave, it was the guitarist from Queens of the Stone Age, and he hadn't actually learned any of the solos. If you're yeah. a James Addiction fan, you know that like the songs sort of crescendo and they always lead into a Dave Navarro solo. And if you're not hitting those notes, we're not orgasming together. Everyone in the crowd is just sort of standing there going, Wow, that was amazing, up until the point that it didn't hit that note. But yeah. then we moved on and we forgave He's, James. He may be a good guitar player, yes. but if you're going to be the only guitar player in a rock band, you better know those songs because that's you have to lead that whole thing. Yeah. And it just but that wasn't off. the worst part of the concert. No. The worst part of the concert was <clears throat> Smashing Pumpkins. Yes. So go ahead, Miranda. Well, the you, you, you had the best take. See, you had the best see, take. CZ came on the live stream and saw. So the Smashing yeah, yeah. Pumpkins came out hard, like really hard. Like they looked awesome. They sounded fantastic. The yeah, whole was- thing was like blew my mind. I was like, this is going to be the best show I have ever seen of anybody bar none. And that's saying a lot coming from Miranda fiction. O'Brien because she's an arrogant concert going <laughs> like aficionado. She gives a shit. I do give a shit. So I thought, and, and you that weren't it was there to see be, Smashing Pumpkins. No, I went to James Addiction. She's been shitting on Smashing no, Pumpkins. No, 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 I hadn't. I like Smashing Pumpkins. I don't love Smashing Pumpkins, but I've never seen them, so I was excited to see them. So they came out, and I thought they were going to be killer. And the first four songs were amazing, and then he proceeded to do two hours of just <laughs> nobody wants to hear songs. It, it, it was like a retrospective where they were playing songs from every album. Like, did you know there was an album? In- 2012 or an album in 2009 like it was just nothing any of us knew and that's completely- the problem in it because we're like yeah. we're the 90s kids right yeah so you wanted a little hit show of back in the fucking day didn't you and like yeah, yeah. and i would everybody there dude we, when we walked into that place <coughs> we look like weirdos that's just wherever yeah. we go we just look like what the fuck we look like this place was filled with 40 somethings 50 somethings, 60 somethings. Yeah. This was not a young crowd. Like so they're all on the same page with you. Just go, well, absolutely. Yeah, people were wearing like like blue, mm-hmm. blue, blue jeans and fucking and like one earring. I saw all these dudes rocking one ear. I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah, you know, drinking wow. large beers. <laughs> they they looked the look like he just put that shit in. in. He was like, I'm gonna put my earring back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so then the two hours in the middle, people were just getting up and walking out. Yeah. Like it was just like people were like, oh, the stadium God. was like half empty for Jane's. And we we're like, whoa, this is going to be weird. And then as soon as Smash Pumpkins came on, the place just filled up. Rammed people were full. there to see Smash yeah. Pumpkins. Yeah. And then, yeah, like three quarters away through the show, the place had emptied out and people were standing around just like mouths agog. Like, what the fuck is happening? I don't know any of these songs. We should get the fuck out of here. And then they did like the last three songs were songs you wanted to hear. They played Cherub Rock. They played, yeah. I can't remember exactly what it was, but no one gave a fuck. We all were still just sitting down, like, bro, you lost us like yeah. 40 minutes ago. Yeah, it was so sad. And then we were like, we should get the fuck out of here anyway. And then the concert just ended. And Billy Corgan came out 
and was like standing and being like, love me, love me. And the crowd was like, fuck you, Billy. And then we all just left. So weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Billy Corgan's, I think, a total narcissist. It's crazy. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a strange dude. Like, I thought he looked like Varys off Game of Thrones. Yeah. Like <laughs> no, he looked like he's Uncle, Uncle Fester. Fester. He's like oh. Uncle Fester to the max now. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, it was creepy. I don't think he'll ever play Gish. I oh, think... that was the other thing, too, is he didn't play a single song off of the first album. No. Nothing. And, like, that no. was my first, you know, Smash Pumpkins album. Like, that's where I, like, fell in love with them. So it was fucked up for, yeah. you know, I touched touch the terrible. Every time in the UK we, we, we were set up to see them, like, they'd, they'd fucking fuck us off. Like, they'd cancel or... I think there was a time when they were just like, we're not doing any more live shows. It was, like, weird yeah. as fuck. Yeah, they it was, well, the band was broken up and, like, and all... They went away. It was weird. Yeah. After yeah. Last, yeah. Last, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, last good album was Melancholy. Um, yeah, no, and I know you're a big fan of Soma. Like, we were yeah. rocking up Soma last time you were here. We were sat in the car. It was yeah. brilliant. And nope, didn't play that. But, Never called uh-huh. back that night. It was messed you up. You have to kill a live track because it just blams in in the middle with that massive yeah. Like, rhythm. Yeah. No, yeah. And, and when they played good songs, they sounded amazing. They looked good. They started strong, and then Billy got his way, and that yes, was the... it. messed up. Well, we just had to get that off our chest. We're really here to talk about Peter, but Peter, I, I see how long that took. Yeah. If we left you, you want to read you on the, in the way. I like learning about other music. It was. But I know up. who they are. At least you didn't say somebody that had no idea who they were. So I was a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I know who they are. Dude, Billy Corgan was so so annoying and the other thing too is he would when he would talk you could just feel the insincerity and then he would make james eha talk and it felt like he was holding him hostage and making him talk so that people didn't so people knew that james wanted to be there because jimmy didn't want anyone to think that james was there under duress billy Billy, jimmy Jimmy chamberlain oh okay (laughs) yeah so anyway all right um so anyway anyway one more thing that was okay, interesting okay. is we took our daughter with us who's 11 and loves music and loves Jane's Addiction and loves Smashing Pumpkins. And I didn't even think about the fact that Jane's Addiction Live is always just naked women. So it was like her first burlesque show too, which was yes. interesting. There were three <laughs> girls in lingerie, really, really like, you know, not their lingerie and projected a lot, you know, onto this huge uh, yeah. screen and Pixie was just kind of like, what the fuck is going on? She was like, she, you know, it's just like <laughs> over her head, like why it was yeah. cool or not cool or whatever. It was awesome. Yeah, it was interesting to hear but her explain it. Let's get Peter. <laughs> yeah, back yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, All right, what people are nonsense. really here for. So yeah, we're here. Is to learn about Peter Van Flores. That's what we're really what? here for. I think what's yeah. funny is why y'all were like talking about the concert. I think it's saying the words are mad small for me. Ask me if I know about Coast Contra. I think they are dope. I was a huge fan of their father, Razkaz, in high school. So in high school, I used to wear a free Razkaz shirt. So I just yeah. wanted to show that uh, I wasn't ignoring the comments. Yeah, no. What does that mean? Um, what is Coast Coast you... Contra. I don't. It's a hip hop group. It's four MCs, and uh, they're they're going viral right now. But I was a big fan of their yeah. father. So yeah, I do like them. I think they have a lot to learn. I feel like they're copying each other's flow sometimes. Um, but they are though. The the entire album I think is a really good album. What album oh. should we be listening to? What album, album. Like right now? It's just one album, Coast Contra. Oh, it's one album. We dropped one album. It's Apartment Something. I forgot what it was. But if you search Coast Contra, it's okay. four All young right. guys. They're really good. That's cool. We'll check them Coast out. Contra. So if you're into hip hop, then yeah, definitely worth checking out. If you're not, it's probably going to be like lyrical spiritual rap. <laughs> okay. Okay. What's lyrical spiritual rap for you? That's uh, the MCs that uh, pretty much put together a lot of big words one after the other. And if you're okay. not in the mood to comprehend an entire song, you're probably going to get super bored right out the gate. Is um, that I think we have a couple of uh, like uh, uh, songs about stories. So it is a dope album. When I listen to Most Def, am I listening to Lyrical Spiritual? At some points, yes. Some points, no. Most Def is one of my top five MCs, though. So Awesome. Like, I can never tell. This is an interesting subject because I kind of feel like he pigeonholed himself as an artist a little bit because he had tried to have an acting career yes and it's like is he an authentic mc because he did this other stuff is that okay now are his albums i think all like i love so many of his albums yeah so 
if you put out like there's the argument about Lauren Hill, is she like one of the best female MCs ever? You take her one album and you put it against, let's say somebody who dropped 10 albums and the other 10 albums are okay, you're probably gonna listen to that one album a lot more. Therefore, that person's gonna be your favorite. So with most deaf, you know, he everything he drops is either great or pretty good. There's nothing that's bad. I mean, some people yeah. said New Danger was bad, but it, I thought it was good. And his movies are great. Like which uh, one was bad? Who said something was bad? Uh, <laughs> there was like that rock album where he did the Black Jack Johnson thing. Some people didn't care. For oh, that. Dude, oh, that's a good one. I like it. I have yeah. it. I love that because for me, the like kind of breakthrough song on Black on Both Sides was hip hop when he rocked and it went it turns into a punk song. And I thought that was brilliant. Talib Kweli is, I mean, because I started with Black Star. Yeah. So, but that's like. Talib is in my top 10. Most is, no, actually, I'll say both most and Talib are my top 10. I'm not going to say top five, top 10. I know you like one of the top five. Change his top, mind. Top five, I, I, had to, I, just, I went back to it Something and I can name five people I listen to more. I just saw Eminem but, but talking. I met, I met my staff at Dismaland when I went to Banksy's Dismaland. Like he, he was playing at Dismaland, so I met him now, so it's pretty cool. You met oh, Mostef there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Isn't his, yeah, he doesn't go by Mostef anymore, right? His name Yassine is Bey. Yassine Bey. The New Danger is an amazing album. I, it is, it I, is. I, I, I and then their, I would say their influence is what, when I opened up the Redefine Gallery out in Orlando like 10 years ago, it's actually named after Redefinition. So there you go. Okay. See, it's all coming around. Yeah. Miranda's favorite most deaf album is Super Magic. Is that what it's called? Is that the one that's yes. not on iTunes anymore? Yeah. I don't know why it's not on iTunes. It's, it's called, it's got a purple cover. It's him like jumping. Yeah, it's a purple oh, cover. It's kind of like the silhouette, the like stencil yeah. look. Yeah. yeah. The reason it it's not on anything is uh, they took it down to put everything on Luminary. They want to control oh. of the So they didn't like the fact that you're getting pennies on the dollar for your art. They felt like they should have control of how much they're making on their art. Uh, yeah. and their true fans will support them how they want to be supported and not dictated how they're supported. Right. I mean, it's true. It does then new into the argument of new fans versus old fans versus people that are going to search you out versus people getting a new yeah. audience, right? That's where you fall into the pitfalls. <clears throat> well, the new Black Star album is only on Luminary. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, it's only you can't get it. In, there's no vinyl. There's nothing. It's only on Luminary, and that's because uh, them with Dave Chappelle signed like a deal with them. Okay. Yeah, they want ownership. Like, but I think that you can listen to it on Spotify. No, I think unless they just recently put it up, because I know most uh, he absolutely hates Spotify. Like he's done really? extensive interviews about how much he hates Spotify. I huh. like you know I talk to uh, kids in their teens and try and proselytize them to listen to good music. I was just turning somebody on to the Octagon Ecologist this week, Dr. Octagon, cool Keith. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like, what the fuck? This is from 1996, blah, blah. <laughs> so I was turning somebody on to um, Black Star like maybe four months ago. And I sent yeah. them a link on Spotify, but I don't think I have a real Spotify account, so I couldn't listen to it in order. You can listen to their old albums because that I don't think it's owned by them, but you can't listen uh, to their new stuff. There's a new Black Star. Yeah, it just came out like maybe two or three months ago, but it's only like I haven't yeah, heard it yet. Well, you right. have to have a subscription well, to Luminary. Because I did, I listened to them talk about that on it's the what's the, the podcast called? The People's. Oh, uh, you're talking about the Drink Champs? Oh, People's Party. The People's Party. Yeah. People's Party. Tell us the podcast. Yeah. Great podcast. It's really good. Yeah, it's a really good podcast. Yeah. So. So let me. Like, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, they have their own podcast with Dave Chappelle, Midnight Miracle, which is like, that is definitely worth listening to. They throw in a, like audio from historical like references, like old movies, old songs, like in the middle to kind of go along with what they're talking about. So let's say we're talking, like it'll yeah. cut off and it'll reference something from like the 70s and just play the audio and then it'll go right back into it. So do you think they've like planned that out? It's pre-recorded. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, yeah it's pre-recorded. It's pre-recorded. Yeah, it's pre okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We should do that. Don Johnny Dungeon says you want some good rap, look up Bill Saber. That's oh and, and but Dangerbot threw it out there. It's called the Ecstatic. That's the Oh yeah, there you go. Yes. Yeah. The yeah, first song the on the Ecstatic is called like Super yeah. Magic. And it's Latin. not it's not on it's not on I'm iTunes. Not start either. Rapping right now, no. no. That would be a bad idea. Yes. So Miranda, 
Yes. We should back up and ask Peter. Oh, we need the first to get question. a Toy Story. So with the question, but, but I don't know if it's a Toy Story. Uh, well, yeah, you, yours is less of a Toy Story than most people, but you do collect toys, as shown by the giant statue, we shall call it, uh, Ashley Wood standing right next to you. So, right. though you may not have made any production toys yet, tell us your Toy Story and how you learned about designing toys and your your you know introduction into it. Yeah, so my, my Toy Story is, I guess, it's still in the prelude or the prequel. Like, I yeah. don't really have a Toy Story, like you said, no production uh, pieces. As far as collecting, I wouldn't say I'm a huge collector, but I do buy what I like. So whether it's popular or not popular, I buy what I like. You know, Good. you take, for instance, this, sorry, the camera's weird, the Ashley Wood. This was like uh, maybe, I want to say three or four years ago at Designer Con, they had like, it's like an 18-inch. And I remember saying, I'm going to come back tomorrow and buy it, and they were sold out. I was following Ashley Wood for years until they re-released it, and they never re-released it. And then they said they were releasing this monster. And uh, oh, wow. of course, because uh, of the price point, I had to like bug Barb, and surprisingly, she was super cool with it. She was like, you've been following that for three or four years. Just buy it. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. but of course, it, so it really- You got an executive sign-off. Yes. This, this thing is like three feet tall. Yeah. Like, that's dope. Yeah, it's three Did feet tall. Bomb? It had to come from China. It came during pandemic, so it came on like a shift. <laughs> uh, it delayed like, I don't know how long, but at that point I didn't care. You know, it was one of those that I paid for it. And I was like, I don't care if it comes in 10 years, it comes, it comes. I finally yeah. got it in my mind, I own it. So I was just happy about that. Um, right. That's awesome. Is yeah, it vinyl? No, it's... Is it vinyl or resin? Uh, I wanna say, it, oh, it's vinyl because like everything comes apart. Like it's like just- Oh, really? No, it's it's not big 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 big. Big. Yeah, knock on it. Or is it um, fiberglass? Let's, let's take it apart. Yeah, let's take it apart and look at it. This is so cool. <laughs> it's so bright. I love it. This is the first wow. time we've done it. That looks, that looks resin to me. It looks resin. like it, it could be fiberglass too. Could be fiberglass. Can, can you, can you, can you show us the joint? Of. Show us the joint again. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Who knows what that is without being Dude. there? It looks rigid, though. It looks rigid. It's definitely fiberglass. because Yeah, it came in pieces. It. I mean, I dropped it by yeah. mistake. And I know it was over. Yeah. Fiber, I mean, you can drop fiberglass in it to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. You've got a better chance with fiberglass. So it's kind of cool that you had to wait and get the actual big boy. You know what I mean? That's cool. Yeah, like I didn't know they were releasing it. I had no idea they were releasing it. Like I just kept following it and, uh, you know, on the verse. And I was like, one day they're going to release that 18 inch again. Never did. Then they released a smaller one. And I'm, I'm not into like really small things. Like as far as like collectability, I tend to lose them. If not, uh, Onyx is like my three-year-old's going to grab them and probably hide them and play with them. Where the big <laughs> ones he won't touch. So yeah. when this right. one released, I was like, yeah, I got to get it. Kyle and, said uh, it wouldn't be vinyl, but the original courses were the forefoot. And they are sinking in on themselves. Like, because they a do. A lot of them are collapsing. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's cool. Cool. Like the biggest vinyl we have is maybe two feet and they don't two collapse. Feet. That's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah, bigger is better. Exactly. And yeah. say it also comments, CZ, I literally only just seen your name and your cam bots are epic. I've been following your Insta for ages. So that's cool. Uh, He's uh, never, seen, maybe never seen your face. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Honest yeah. loves your cam bots, by the way. Like I ended up getting uh, during the Kickstarter some of the like the blind boxes. So he plays with uh, like the doubles, he plays with them all day. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah, right. that's yeah. Right. He walks. That's he walks cool. around like. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Get, get yeah. him young. Get him collected. Oh yeah, no, no. What, no, was, no. what was the first yeah, designer toy that you got, Peter? It was a bear brick. It was actually, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the movie Saw. It was that bear brick, and um, the owner. I had no idea what a bear brick was, by the way. I had just opened up Redefine. Uh, now probably twelve years ago. I don't remember. Um, but I had a wholesale account. I don't remember where it was through, but they were releasing the bare bricks. I had no idea what it was, but I needed to fill my store with something beside like canvas and shirts. And I got them. Uh, they actually just sat there. I, I don't think Orlando, Florida really knew what they were. And then I remember putting them on eBay and selling them out in like a week, but I kept one. Um, so I actually still have that one. And inside the gallery, we actually carried the clutter magazine. Um, and it was that juxtaposed. And there was one more. And those are the only three magazines. That's Even awesome. when I go back now, like 12 years later in the new location, they asked me if we're getting Clutter Magazine back. Like, <laughs> we, 
Nice. That would be awesome if we could still keep doing this. It's, it's I would happening love to all go around us right now. To a magazine. Yeah. This is quite a so, magazine. Like, so, so, so I would say you, um, oh, man, I forgot who, who the wholesaler was, but it was specifically having to fill out a street art gallery that was just all canvas and t-shirts. I was like, we need some type of toys because we knew there was Kid Robot down in Miami and we always made sure to visit when we drove down there. And I was like, hey, we got to put some of this stuff in Orlando. And it was just pretty much you guys um, then... Yeah, from toys, it was just straight up. It was you guys. That's it. You were the only toy magazine we actually carried. And then we had just like a handful of toys that we got from the wholesaler. Um, it's crazy that I don't remember who they were. Well, it was so probably DKE. It was probably DKE. But so let's go back and talk Dove, about how, where, where the gallery concept came from. So you grew up in New York, right? Grew up in New York, Lower East Side, uh, Avenue D, more specifically. Um, I was there for 20 something, like 21, 22 years or something like that. Um, so from the 80s down to like the early 2000s. D and what? Uh, so 12th is where I grew up. And then for like two years, I was on 8th and D, but 12th and D for majority of my life. Isn't the my power life. plant on 12th and D? Yeah, we're right there. We grew up with the power plant. Yeah. I, uh, Barbara thinks that's why you I know that there. spot. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, right but, around the corner from yeah. our favorite bar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay yeah, right there. We're, uh, I'm right by the power plant and the water plant. Like, right, like literally it's the same block. I'm um, thinking of the power plant. Is that... That's near that airport, isn't it? No. no you know where Otto Shrunken Head is? It's right yeah. there. Shrunken Head, yeah. Of course I know that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there was, you came out of Otto yeah. and you down. took a right and walked right to the highway. Instead of okay. going yeah, down yeah, the road. Instead of walking that way, the other way. that way. That's right there. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So Con that, Edison. Oh, look, my godmother's on. That's crazy. I think that's yeah. my godmother. Oh, what's up? Yeah, it says, yeah, Con Edison. That's my godmother. She out in Florida. Hey, what's, what's, up, awesome. <laughs> hey, what's up? Yeah. Um, yeah. And what's crazy about that power plant is like that was one of the first things that they altered about the city after 9-11 was they shut that exit yeah. off the FDR. So it was like, oh, you could launch a car right into the power plant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we were also be, uh, supposed to make an L train stop there too, and they decided like to do that. Right. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's obviously critical infrastructure. Yeah. So, and then the other thing was they didn't want to stop between Avenue D and like the first stop in Brooklyn. Probably wasn't going to be like the safest stretch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. But I, then, yeah. I don't, exactly. I don't think uh, as a young man, I, you know, I, I lived in the East Village. I went to uh, school in the city in like the mid 90s. I don't think I ever went past B until. I met a lot of people like that when I was older. Until like nine, until like maybe 98, 99. Makes and then sense. we were, and, and then basically everyone in the city was like, you're allowed to go to Avenue State. <laughs> I met a lot of people Even like the that. Cop, the, if you they if you were standing on Avenue C and you look like me, they were like, What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> that that's accurate. That's accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Because I lived yeah, on no, no. I lived I lived on Ridge Street and Houston. Okay. And if I sat in a car, if it was like one in the morning and someone drove me home and I sat in the car for a minute to like say goodbye, the cops would roll up and be like, what the fuck? Like, yep. really? Get the fuck out of here. And I'd be like, no, no, I live here. And they're like, then go home and get out of the car and go home. Yeah. So. yeah. Now that I, when I got older and started working like as a teenager, then you start meeting different people like, you know, outside, you know, where I grew up, it's pretty much Hispanic, black and Asian because we have Chinatown mm -hmm. on the other side. Yeah. Um, but as I got older, you know, I started like my first, like, I would say white friend, like white American friend was probably 17, 18 years old. And yeah. they asked me where I lived. I said, Avenue D. They didn't know where it was. Turns out they lived in Stuyvesant, which was two blocks over. Their parents. Well, right. right. And their parents would probably just like wipe that from their mind. Yes. Like, I was like, oh, I can't cross it. They were like, oh, we're not allowed to go there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. All that's over there is a power plant. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, Stuyvesant literally looks onto that. Yeah. That's right crazy. here. So you look at Stuyvesant. That's wild. That's crazy. So you went to school in the city too. You did what? You went to college in the city? No, no. So uh, elementary school, junior high school, um, high school. I, I tried college, but it didn't work for me. Actually, I got kicked out of high school, but then I ended up going to BMCC, uh, the college uh, down there, and it just wasn't for me. So I actually, technically, never graduated college. That's that's awesome that you uh, got kicked out of high school and now. <laughs> yeah, there you go, man. <laughs> I, I wasn't bad. I just didn't go yeah. and do anything like you, know. <laughs> you weren't that it wasn't your frequency 
it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, I remember getting into an argument though with uh, the guidance counselor about that because it was like it was for anybody familiar with the Lower East Side at that point it was Sewer Park High School, which was one of like the worst schools. So I didn't understand why I was getting kicked out when I wasn't like a bad kid. So right. I remember getting into an argument with the guidance counselor about that. And what did right. they say? They just like, man, well, uh, they, I, I, they, I was. I remember I was 17 years old, and I, they just couldn't give me like a logical reason. They were like, "Look, you just don't come." And I was like, "But I come enough to pass like what I need to." I don't know, that's a lie. I was absent 76 times from one class, but. What were you doing? Me to Washington Irving on 14th Street. So what what were you doing when you weren't going to class? I was hanging out at McDonald's a lot, like across the street. Um, with the McDonald's you know, when I was young, you know, McDonald's, had, had a girl, time, McDonald's. Out a lot with her, some friends playing basketball. The one on Avenue, was it? Is it First Avenue, the McDonald's? Oh no! So uh, Sewer Park is by Delancey. Okay. So by so wherever where the bridge is, whether we're just trying to locate you exactly. The oh, yeah. There's like yeah. a weird market, indoor market there now. But if you go behind that building, there's yeah. a. There's a high school there. I don't know what it's called. It's not Sewer Park no more. Sewer Park went like we're not a business or something. I don't know. Okay. So East Coast or West Coast hip hop? Hip hop? Oh yeah. Oh, that's East Coast for me. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. There's West Coast artists that I like, but easily uh, East Coast for me. East Coast. Good answer. Miranda doesn't even realize she's just like asking like, <laughs> such a fucked up question. Like, <laughs> I was going to do it. And there was a lot of people have been getting this, this question a lot lately. I even saw Raskas. He posted, they asked Danny Brown the same thing. And his answer was just like mine. He was like, uh, it's easily East Coast. But then he named Raskas' album, going back to Coast Contra, their father, the twins' father, um, uh -huh. as a West Coast album that's really good. But East Coast hip hop easily. All right. Who's the best yeah. ever East Coast MC? Well, that's a tough one. Um, so I always have this argument where you can say who's the best versus who's your favorite. Right. So. I can easily say to me, like maybe Nas would be the best, but he's not necessarily my favorite. I haven't listened to a Nas album in probably a year. So, you know, I can easily say Nas, you know, Jay-Z took a while to grow on me. That was up there for, for Jay-Z. Um, but I can honestly say I listen to like Busta Rhymes a lot more. I listen to pretty much any Wu-Tang member a lot more. Uh, Boot Camp Click, I listen to a lot of those guys a lot more. Doesn't necessarily mean they're probably the best in their craft, but they're my favorite. So if I, like, I had to pick one to exist, it probably wouldn't be the ones that are considered the favorites. Yeah. I mean, the best, sorry, the best. It would be my favorite. Yeah. Danger Bot saying MF Doom. Yeah. I, I love MF Doom. It took me a while to get on him though. I'm not gonna lie. Those are one of those guys. He's like ASAP Rock, not ASAP Rocky, ASAP Rock. Where when yeah. I was young, dude asked me when I was a teenager, I couldn't stand them. And then as I got older and I think I started comprehending vocabulary and like, uh, like just different theories, I started liking the MF Dooms and uh, you know the ASAP Rocks and, and like that. So now so, I now I love MF Doom, but yeah, you would ask me when I was seventeen years old, I'd be like, nah. Right. Go ahead. I have a question. Okay. So, so when did you first start making art, and particularly street art, putting you know your art on the streets? Uh, for me, that was probably maybe 22, 23 years old. I moved to Florida. And okay. I, I met some artist friends out there. And one of them, Tobar, Chris Tobar, he's like an art director out in Austin now. But in Orlando, he was a street artist, gallery artist. And he would always ask why, you know, I never put anything up in the street or do murals. At that point, I was just doing graphic design. You know, I was, I was just trying say, to make what, What's your story before that? Were you doing art before that? And then Yeah, so I was yeah. doing like graphic design and like, right, right. you know, more stuff like that. I remember this was back in like 99, 2000, doing those like, the banners on like hip hop sites. So I would get a commission to do like the little banners when you go onto like a hip hop site. And it, so it was all graphic work for me. Like I went to art school in New York. Um, you know, after I got kicked out of Seward, I went to BMCC, it didn't work out. And then I went to an art school, went for like a semester, but it was more to learn graphic design and uh, visual communications, which I ended up leaving that too. But I, I was just doing graphic design. That was it. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Tobar was a graphic designer who was uh, graduating from Full Sail at the time, university out in Florida. And he would go, you're doing these designs on the computer. You're doing them on t-shirts. Why not just put them on a wall? And I was like, my right, painting okay, sucks. that's the connection. I'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, my painting sucks. I can't do that. Like, you know, I, I, I do this. And then he's the one that kind of showed me we paste yeah. and, you know, how to get the stuff. And then we did our first wall together. And then from there, it was anytime I got invited or like if I had the opportunity to just get a wall myself and then really hitting the street whenever I started traveling with Barbara. So like when we were in Brazil, you know, hitting a wall at nighttime, 
um, that's probably where it started. I would say hitting a couple of walls in Brazil and then coming back to the U.S. and then saying, okay, we can do some walls here and there. It's just that it's not like graffiti. It takes a little bit long because, you know, you got to get the lead page prepped. I'm not doing these little like one foot or two footers. Like I'm trying to go like anywhere from, you know, six feet to 13 feet. So yeah. d doing a wheat paste wall at 13 feet, you're not going to do that in a span of two minutes. Like you're definitely going to get caught. Yeah. So have you got a magic little formula for the paste or do you not want to share? So I used to mix some, some like a, pretty much this terrible concoction. And then, uh, I started using Earl Loop. He's based out of California. Um, I saw Sniff in the comments. I know he also uses it. Um, <laughs> Earl Lube is pretty much a industrial style wheat paste that doesn't yellow. Um, holds up really well in the streets, like really, really well. Uh, and it's also, I believe, weatherproof. So it's called Earl Lube uh, wheat paste. Uh, if you search for it online on Instagram, you'll find it. But I actually have like a couple of buckets of that. Right, right. Nice, nice. That's yeah. a good tip. I, I always made up like, I used to use like, just wallpaper paste but then i'd like i'd put wood glue in it as well and that yeah. kind of made it like watertight enough do you know what i mean so but i don't know if I don't know. yeah i i had to go industrial because what i found when i would try to make they my own them big pieces like you know yeah and it'll last for like maybe a couple of weeks but then you start seeing it fold down yeah, you start yeah. seeing it weather you start seeing it turn yellow like for a while i was using uh the wallpaper paste that you can get at um home depot and, and, you know, mixing in like, you know, some sugars and some different types of things in it just to make it last. But yeah. what I found was that wallpaper paste from Home Depot was better for like gallery shows where yeah. the industrial stuff like Earl Lou wheat paste, like I can use that in the street and it was gold and like nothing was going to happen. Like I had pieces last over a year and we're talking about paper in Florida where it rains, you know, half the year. Every day at two o'clock. So, like, you, you got up for like over a year on that piece, man. That's fucking weird. Yeah, yeah, no, I've had pieces up <laughs> over a year. Uh, when I use the right pace, if I use like the homemade pace, it's not going to last a year. If I use the Earl Lube, it'll last. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, people are, are, are ripping it. I mean, obviously, people are going to rip it, they're going to rip it. But as far as weathering, like, it's lasted. I've even had a piece, I think, hit the snow and it was fine. Wow. Yeah. So, Minerva has done some deep research for us. That's my godmother. godmother. Right? Yes. Yes. yes, yes, but she's, so your father was a graffiti artist. He was a graffiti artist. He went by Stor, S-T-O-R. Um, my mother had me when she was six, uh, 14 and my father was 16. So, uh, you know, I heard a lot of stories about him carrying markers around, carrying cans around and stuff like that. Um, he went by S-T-O-R, you know, doing walls, probably at the trains. Um, he used to tease me when I was a kid because I couldn't read his letters. So said I would never be an artist. And uh, there you go. You know? <laughs> my mother also had a good hand style. Like my mother. Oh, I see my mother's in there too. Says you better write. That's funny. She wrote, yes, it's in his blood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, no way. That's awesome. That's hilarious. So by the way, none of my parents or my godmother live on the on the West Coast. So they're all on the East Coast right now listening. Uh, they're, they're all on our time. Yeah, yeah. This works yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah. Perfect yeah. time. Yeah, your prime time here. Prime time. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm seeing like childhood friends. That's funny. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, my, my father went by STOR. My mother went by Bambi. So uh, my mother used to write Bambi. She had a cool hand style. Um, I was actually oh, working wow. on something and I was going to use like her tag for something. I don't know if you can see it, but like back here, this is like, it's about to take it off the wall. Take this it is off. actually her hand style. I don't think she's seen this, but this is her hand style. So. Look at that. That's awesome. That's amazing. Never did anything with this. It was like a practice. I do a lot of pra practice sheets. Yeah, and so uh, cool. there you That's go. She's really Bambi. Cool. That's actually her handwriting. She like oh. she drew it out. She sent it to me on like a like a photo thing, and I just redid it on photo. Yeah, you can put it in the show next year, and she can she can come to the gallery show too, and she can be part of it. There you I'm go. sure. She, oh, she'll be in Florida. Let's see if she comes. Oh, That's great. Yeah, I don't think yeah. she's ever seen that. I do like a lot of practice, like just things. That's so awesome. What was, like, what was it like for you as a as a kid then with two parents that are like like getting up man do you know what i mean they're they're, what they're doing graffiti they've got hand style shit going on what what so the hand style stuff on? i saw the graffiti stuff i wasn't a part of because i was too young um also they split up by the time i was about seven years old um right but they always encouraged it like it wasn't the story the sad artist story where they wanted to do art and the parents are like no get a real job yeah nice. Like, yeah. you know they, they were both super cool with it you know my mother helped me out with going to the art school uh, she helped me out with moving to Florida, wanting to get out of the Lower East Side. Uh, she's always come to my art shows. Even when I opened the gallery, you know, she supported that for a little bit. Um, 
Uh, and it's funny, like, you know, I had both sides of it as them being previous writers where, you know, my father, you know, ended up doing some time. He was in prison for a while. Um, and my mother was a detective. So I always got like kind of. Oh, wow. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> That's oh, well, no, they were 14 and 60 when they. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they well, that would be so cool if like. When... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I get support from both sides. And, you know, even my mother being a detective, it wasn't like she was like, no, you can't do that. I remember going wheat pasting one time. This was like I was living in Florida. I flew back to New York and it was one of those like I used to go through these depression and anxiety spells. So I would have to go back to New York for a while to just get my head clear, go back home. And I remember going out like at one or two in the morning to go wheat pasting. And my brother saw me. I was with, I mean, stereotype black hoodie with a poster tube ready to go outside. And my brother was like, I want to go. And then my mother came out there and she was like, what are you doing? I said, nothing. She was like, I know what that look is. And then she went and she got a hoodie and she came out with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad she came out because we got caught on like the first session. She, I swear, she goes like this. She turns her back and she takes out a badge and goes, and they keep going. So <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my I probably should have not told that story, but it's, it's, uh, enough time passed. She's retired. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. No, but still, that's awesome. That's a yeah, good no, story. That's support. That's that real is. love. Like, yeah. So, you know, wow. you know, having both of them come in art, like I, I, I got the support that I needed. That's a good mom. We love you, mom. That's great. No, that's great that's memory. special, man. That's really good. That's yeah. really, that's a great story. I'm never gonna forget that story. No. That, that, that that's the one that when I tell people, they're like, "Nah, you're lying," and then they meet my mother and they're like, "Oh, I can see that." <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Red Guardian and uh, Robots Will Kill Chris, uh, they met my mother last time. And I, I think if you ask them, they'll be like, oh, yeah, we see it. We see it. Yeah, they're like, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. She's only 14 years older than me. So, you know, when you see her, they, she looks like my sister. So they're like, all right. You know, right, they're not getting right. like a mom type when they see her. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Young, yeah. So then is, is Van your artist name or is Peter Van Flores your full name? <laughs> so my real name is just Peter Flores. Um, Peter Flores Jr. So I changed, I added the van for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was like, I actually, I don't think anybody knows this part, but when my father did time, um, I would get phone calls from like just different agencies asking for Peter Flores Jr., which my father was the same name, even with Jr. at the end. So I was like, well, I got to find a way to kind of separate myself from that. Um, like I remember even traveling, coming back from, uh, I think it was Brazil. We got stopped by customs and they asked me if I was Peter Flores Jr. from Brooklyn. And I was like, no, I'm Peter Flores Jr. from the Lower East Side. So I kind of had to find a way to, to switch it out. And then that was one reason where I started thinking already, I got to change my name somehow. And then the way Van came up was it's just a joke. Um, we were at a, I was at like a coffee shop or 7-Eleven or something with a couple of artist friends. And they all had like art names, like Tobar, you know, his, his real name was something else, but his name was Tobar. I was with Saki Chop. Uh, you know, I think we just left Swamburger. And, you know, so I was like, damn, I'm the only one with like a real name, Peter Flores. So I was like, I got to do something in between. So then I, I said, what's a cool name? And I was like, oh, I'm going to be like Jean-Claude Van Damme. So I'm going to be Peter Van Flores. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It ended up putting it on a flyer and it, it, people just started calling me that. And I was just like, and then I started signing it and then it just kind of stood. But yeah, it became like a long joke that day. Like they were like, shut up. And I was like, no, nah, think about it. Everybody that has that in their name is cool. And I was like, Dick Van Dyke. You take out that van, they're like Dick Dyke, you know. And I was like, and so I just ran with it, and it's been probably twelve or thirteen. I've even had people when I was traveling to, I think it was Ireland, reach out, and they were like, "Oh, they respect the vans over there." Reach out to this person, and I was like, "Damn, am I, am I appropriating?" I was like, "I'm Puerto Rican." I'm not. <laughs> isn't that? Uh, isn't it Dutch? <clears throat> That's is the thing. Like when when I read your name, and, and, and obviously you do the weak person. I just see it and I just think you live in Amsterdam. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone I know like Pace in Amsterdam and, and your name's your name. Like, and I'm just like, when I picture you, just like, oh yeah, I bet he's having fun in Amsterdam. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's what it's part. yeah, when I went to Amsterdam and uh, Ireland, I've gotten people reaching out to me to reach out to certain people. And I'm like, damn, like this went too far. Um, <laughs> but at that point, I mean, it's been like over, you know, it's been what, 12, 13 years or something like that. So I mean, it's kind of- that's kinda... the legal name, right? Yeah, that's like I actually consider changing it, you know, my, my legal name, but I, I just don't like paperwork. So paperwork. Well, no, it's not your real name. The way it's it works in New York State is if you use that name, you can just change it. Becomes it becomes your yeah. name. Uh, you know, for, for a long time, the first, the second art gallery. So we ended up moving locations. They didn't know. And on the lease, it actually said Peter Van Flores. 
So, so and I just signed it. Rich, in New York, that's, not real. that's your okay. legal name. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. so the, there, there, there's an old expired lease out there oh that's just Peter Van Flores. So let's back up for a second then. And since we've mentioned the gallery, how far back times, can we get with him? Well, we're well like, no, we've gone forward to like okay, the second okay, gallery. Okay, okay. So second gallery location. So let's back up and talk about how you opened the gallery, where that came from, like what, how did that, how did that happen, Peter? How did you open a gallery? So when I was in New York, I met this guy who was actually like a up and coming act out in LA now. But back then he was just like a Dominican kid from a Spanish Harlem. And we linked up on like a hip hop site and we talked about opening like a art slash like underground hip hop store, kind of like a fat beats. We were both teenagers, had no money, no idea what we were doing. So of course we like dreamt up names and being hip hop heads at first we said beneath the surface, which was like a jizz album, Wu-Tang Clan. And uh, there was like four of us. Turns out none of us saved the money. Um, so it never happened. He ended up moving to LA, ended up on a couple of TV shows. I don't know what happened to the other two kids. I ended up in Florida. Still had that dream, but again, no money, just moving to Florida. And I was working at Timberland at the time, and which is where I met Barbara, by the way. She was my boss there, different story. Um, but there was this girl that worked there and her boyfriend was a graffiti artist. His name is Spec out in Orlando, dope artist. And uh, he had a t-shirt line. And I started helping him with some of like the Photoshop stuff. And eventually we just said, you know, we should just open up something. And we ended up opening the first, like we thought, he thought Beneath the Surface was too long. And I agree, being older at the time, I was like, yeah, Beneath the Surface is mad long. And uh, we stood with the hip hop theme and I was like, redefinition. I was like, most deaf and Talib. And he was with it. So then we were told redefinition was too long. So we said, all right, let's shorten it to redefine. And, uh, but it was just me linking up with the graffiti artist um, when I was working out in Timberland. And uh, we ended up saving money because we figured we both work retail. We know how to do this. Um, we obviously didn't know how to do it because that one only lasted like a year. Um, we didn't realize financially it's just draining, especially for two, like, you know, a 22, 23 year old and a 25 year old. Um, so that completely much drained us. Um, yep. But it was a good experience. I remember trying to like open up a shop and we both didn't really have a name behind us. Like I remember re reaching out to Chris, uh, Robots with Kill. <laughs> And he was just like, nah, like trying to get like his shirts in there. Yeah. <laughs> he ended up becoming the homie. And I'm glad he said no, because I wasn't ready to take on like, you know, uh, an artist of his caliber yet. So we yeah. figured the best way to do it is go the kind of commercial route through like wholesalers. And then we hit some uh, newer upcoming brands that were just trying to do art, like from like Colorado and different places and doing really small wholesale accounts. Like I'm talking about, hey, I have $300 to give you. How many shirts can you give us? And right. they were brand new, like, you know, the clothing line. So they were like, what? You're going to give me $300 for X amount of shirts? Yeah, here you go. So we did it that way. But we just wanted a way to get like our shirts out there and our canvases out there. And galleries Chris, weren't really messing with us like that. Chris just popped into the chat. He's like, what of me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was him. It's a great, it's funny. I, I tell Crummy Gummy, he's friends with Crummy. Crummy Gummy's one of my business partners in Parker, but I tell Crummy Gummy about that. Where Chris is the homie now. Like he supports me. I support him. Uh, I got most of my opportunities because of like Robots Will Kill. I always say that. He doesn't even realize it. Um, Cause even if you think about it, us with the, you know, me with you guys, like you got it. I got introduced to you through. Uh, yes. our I mean, I knew Absolutely. of you, you guys didn't know of me. So, you know, he got me into your gallery. Absolutely. Um, no, that's important. Cool, was... Chris has been a long, he's been around for so long. Though, and, you know, oh yeah, he, he was already an icon back, you know, over 10 years ago when I was yeah. trying to open up an art gallery. Um, yeah. Sorry, so... Kyle's making me laugh. Kyle's yeah, yeah, the Chris the huge joke, which everybody knows <laughs> is not true. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, Chris is, yeah. the, but like Chris I said, he ended up becoming a homie. We've done a couple of shows with him now in the new space, and I'm glad. He act and I think that's the thing sometimes when people say no, like people are like, nah, that guy's whack. I'm never messing with him again, where we weren't ready to host something like that. Right. You know? So I'm glad that he said no, because later on when we got our stuff together and we started getting a little name for ourselves, we had something to offer. Because a lot of times it's you have something to offer me, but I have nothing to offer you. Right, yeah. so timing is key. Like sometimes it's just not the right time. It's not the right time. Just take a long time, and then it's the right time. Like yes. it's just yeah. You just gotta be patient. You know, you gotta be patient because yeah. I, I do. That's the one thing I don't like about the art community. You know, where somebody says no to something all of a sudden, they're just like, nah, that's my enemy for life. And I'm like, nah, yeah, maybe no, maybe you gotta keep building yourself up. You know, don't get mad at them because they're at a different level. Right. You know, don't get Absolutely. mad at them. You know. 
And then when we reapproached them, you know, many, many years later, we had a really, really good show in uh, our second space. Then when that one closed, we opened up a different space a few blocks down. And I believe he's done something with us there or going to. And so, yeah, great relationship with Chris. So mm -hmm. how long has that gallery been, been going in different locations? But so the time. first location was due to pretty much, I'm not going to lie, just failure. Like we just couldn't handle it. Um, sure, and but then, you didn't give up, which is key too. Like you failed, but then you kept going. Yeah. Now the second location, um, I had to switch partners because sometimes you have to do that too. Oh. You know, sometimes it's not, you don't open something or start something with the people that you're going to end up being successful with. Totally. Um, just heard that on uh, the Math Pop Up podcast with Slaughterhouse. You Sometimes you don't start something that you're meant to finish with, but people, you know. Anyway, yeah. so Speck ended up doing his own thing, and I had no kind of, like, desire to open up a second gallery, and we ended up doing a, a group show in a place called the City Arts Factory, and they just happened to have an empty space, like an empty, like, pretty much storefront. And when I went to pick up my art, they were like, oh, you're the guy from Redefine. And I was like, yeah, they said, would you reconsider opening here? And I was like, nah. And a friend of mine approached me and was like, yo, let's do this. And I was like, nah, I'm good. And then he called me and was like, Pete, let's do this. And again, it didn't work out with that person, but I ended up opening with a guy named Parker, who to this day is my partner. A super quiet guy, photographer, amazing painter. He teaches illustration. Uh, uh, he taught illustration for like 10 years and super quiet. He was like, let's do it. And very quiet, no emotion. And, uh, <laughs> very quiet, no emotion. Very quiet. And everybody in Orlando knows him and he doesn't really talk. Um, so Corey... Corey and Chris are both talking in the chat in the chat about how hanging out at Redefine was amazing and how it influenced them. And then Chris just said that it was some of his favorite shows of all time have been at Redefine. What would you say is really special about the way you do shows at Redefine? Well, first, I appreciate that because I had no idea they felt that way. I know Strange Cat did shows with us. That That's was why we do these podcasts, to bring out, you know, the real inner feelings. I'll shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, no, yeah, like, I had no idea. Like, I, I know that a lot of them, you know, worked with Parker and Crummy Gummy, my partners. And I know Strange Cat came along after I left to California. But I didn't realize they felt that way. To me, we were just kind of a, like, when I hear Strange Cat, when I hear Chris, you know, Robots Will Kill, we're just small pieces. Like, I, I think we have no impact. We're just, oh, yeah, they did us a favor and they did a, a show in our space. Like, that's the way I look at it. Like, oh, these big artists or these big companies are doing shows in our space. They're doing us redefine a favor. Because even 10 years later, I don't feel redefine has the name that a lot of other galleries have. Some people are like, redefine, what's that? I'm like, yeah, we've been there over 10 years, but I understand we're not at that level. So like for somebody, a strange cat or Chris to say, oh, we love there, or we did this there. For me, that's like, oh, damn, to me, y'all were doing us a favor because a lot of people still don't know who you are. You only really ever have your own experience. So you can never tell what other people's experiences are or how they feel or what impacts them. So it's always good to hear people talking about it. We've yeah, got the no, whole that, yeah, urban, urban robot, robot cat, cat in the chat. That's true. Don't you should all that. jump on. We'll send you the link. You can come on and just reform on here. And, and that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we but schedule even, that as a show? Yeah. Can we do that as a show? Will all of you Let's come just, on a show and yeah, do we'll just, Urban Robot Cut? That you got to get awesome. Crummy Gummy with them. Crummy Gummy's hilarious. I think oh, he's yeah. out in London right now. Um, but what we did differently was, you know, I remember the local paper had wrote a story about Redefine saying it was the first art gallery ran by artists. Like it wasn't ran by like curators or just investors or just kind of somebody who went to art school but didn't really do art. It was actually ran by artists. So, right. you know, when what we would do is I saw JC Rivera was there, too. So like when the, shout out to him, he did a show with us. Um, yeah. So. When they came in, we did something that a lot of art galleries weren't doing because they didn't want the headache of having to change it every single time. We pretty much would ask them, what color do you want the wall? And if they said pink, we painted the entire gallery pink. They said, why we painted white? And then we let them just go crazy on it. What a and bit. I'm talking about like we night do that. Dude, <laughs> that's, 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 that's rough. That's rough. Commitment. That's rough. Oh, it sucked. I, I would be, I mean, it, it was great as far as like the end product, the process yeah. sucked. Because yeah. I would be there to four in the morning. And then when I left, of course, yeah. it was Crumb yeah. and Parker. I, but, feel, yeah. I feel like the last time we did that here, it was with Huck. We, we did the second. The time, I think we did then, the second yeah. Huck G blank show here. And he wanted like everything in a straight line. So I was like, oh, I'll paint a gray stripe down the whole gallery. 
it must have taken me 18 months to, to get rid to of paint it. that line <laughs> out of the wall because you could just look and just see, like oh my god it's hard that's tough that's hard yeah, no, we, literally they can paint and do whatever they want in there the only thing that was off limit was like the glass and the floors right but yeah. everything else they, they had like you know we had you know robots would kill we had jc rivera we had wolves angry robots wolves yeah. um we, we had a ton of people we had artists from brazil uh artists from mexico and they would paint literally from ground to ceiling like a mural inside and we had it was a very small gallery it was about six or seven hundred square feet but it was a big glass window so everybody that walked by would see this mural from outside nice. and you know so, right, it only, so they, would, they would paint it right they would paint it. we would just be like hey look come we you know if we have the funds we'll supply the paint yeah, here's the right. keys to the gallery we'll hang out with you if we're gonna go you you know, and then there was times where it was a financial headache because, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, but I would fly, you know, artists down just because we had no name. And I would pay for like the most like rough motel in the neighborhood. You know, I remember having Nate Van Dyke from San Francisco come down. And, you know, at this point, I didn't have Is much that money. That real like, last name? <laughs> Nate Van Dyke. Yeah, there you go. That's like, no relation. Uh, no relation. <laughs> but, you know, at that point, he was doing a, a lot of things with Up a Playground. And we paid for his flight, you know, we paid for it. It's a little rough hotel, the paint, and it was way more than we can afford, you know? So the beginning was a financial headache for us, but we felt that was the only way to get our name out because a lot yeah. of the galleries that opened up were dope, but they just closed down. And yeah. uh, this ended up creating a name, but then after a while, we were just like, we can't do it no more. So we contemplating on closing, but instead we brought Crummy Gummy along and we changed the business model, the business plan. And we said, look, we can only do that for people that are down to, be are coming down for family coming down for vacation yeah. then it was different we no longer had to oh. book based on hey we want to fly you over at this point it was like hey if you're going to be in orlando sometime next year let's set something up yeah let's set something up um so it became a little bit easier that was the old space and that's what we did differently um the new space is smaller it's uh and it's on the second floor of a building um orlando actually asked us to stick around when we thought about closing because i was moving uh, to california so it's a smaller space it's on the second floor but it still gets it gets a lot of visibility unfortunately it's a historic not unfortunately it's a dope historic building but unfortunately because it's historic we can't do murals inside anymore so now right. it's like a straight art gallery right chris said he left his nine to five job to go to the airport to Orlando, then right to the gallery to paint the wall. So much fun and no sleep. Is that something that you could still do, Chris? Because I don't think I could do that anymore. Like we used to do <laughs> stuff like that. And now I'm like, oh God, the thought of that makes me sick. <laughs> like I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah. Man. Yeah, no, I couldn't. I, I used to do that because I was working retail when we used to do like the murals. And uh, the place that I worked in at that point closed at 11 p.m. So we would wow. close at 11 p.m. I would go home, I would eat something, and then I would go straight to the gallery. You know, I think having artists in different time zones was also like, it was fun, but it was a headache. You know, I had a yeah. guy from Brazil there and it was like 4.30 in the morning and he's like, I'm gonna do this entire section over. And I'm just like, young, <laughs> like, I'm gonna be tired. Like, <laughs> you're not familiar with like the US, you know, I'm not just gonna leave you downtown by yourself, but I'm about to, like, I'm mad tired. And it's like 4.30 yeah. in the morning, you know, he's used yeah. to doing like these huge murals, super pop colors already did like, you know, 12 layers of the same color. I'm like, it looks good, trust me. You know, yeah. trust yeah, me. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah, let's yeah. stop, let's go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I gotta go back, I'm mad tired, I'm gonna fall asleep here. Um, so what involvement do you have You gotta deal now? with artists, right? You gotta deal yeah. with artists, and artists haven't got a, a time yeah. scale, man, do you so, know what I mean? Like, I was like, like that's funny, I was like, what is CZ about to say about artists? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 when, you know, when I was hanging out at the Street Art Museum in in Amsterdam and the, and, and the artists that I was painting with, they were all around the world, you know what I mean? So they'd come in and they'd be like, no, I, I want to do it now. And it's like, dude, it's fucking late, man. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so they're like, they're spraying up at like stupid o'clock. And, and it's like, and it's the mad little demands that come in. It's just like, dude, I need, I need fucking weed. Like, do you know what I mean? And they're like, dude, you need to get me weed. Like, blah, blah, blah. So I can paint. And, and the mad little stories that fucking happen with that. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Nah. it makes for interesting stories though, because at four in the morning, especially in a downtown, you see some interesting things. That's so, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it, it's you know dealing with the different time zones, the different personalities. Like a lot of times, you're dealing with artists you never met in person. Like you're meeting yeah. them for the first time there. Could be you know they're used to being waited on. Like you know, here's everything for you. Lay down. 
Uh, then there's some people that it's their first time doing something like this. So they don't know how to help. They don't know what to do. They don't want to offend you. Um, so it, it's definitely a learning process doing that and working with them. Um, but yeah, I think what we did differently was just us being artists and understanding that, damn, this person wants to work at 2.30 in the morning. I understand because there's times that I wake up at 2.30 in the morning because I feel like doing a canvas. So you kind of understand their thought process behind it. But then when you separate yourself out of that artist space and you're like, all right, now I'm running a gallery and a curator, you have to be able to accept that, you know? And then yeah. you start thinking, damn, is that what I did to that gallery? Damn, I, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it was definitely learning. The, the gallery is still there. Park and Crummy Gummy do a great job with it. I'm not going to lie. Like being in California, I've been pretty disconnected. Like I make sure that I still connect the artists with them. Yeah. Um, but as far as like the business practices and everything like that, I'm not so much tied anymore. Um, but still very much part of like, you know, the three headed monster between me, Crummy Gummy and Parker. Um, still sending artists their way. You know, like I believe Night Owl uh, from Oakland just had a show there and did pretty well. Um, so, you know, I'm still linking artists with them. And there are some artists that prefer to talk to Crummy Gummy. There's some that prefer to talk to me, some, you know, to Parker. Nothing about personality, just more so that's who you met first. That's who you're comfortable sure. with. Sure. That's yeah. awesome. So, yeah, fun, uh, fun it gallery. Is real tough. It is real tough. I'm just, yeah, we've had yeah. lots of experiences over the years, you know. It's really fun having artists come in, especially ones that you don't necessarily know that well. And the relationships that you form with new artists, it's its amazing. We've had such good experiences. Yeah, no, it's great to bond with someone over the yeah. weekend and you just like become tight. And then, you know, go unfortunately, they, they, they go back, you know, go but, you, you know, you never forget those experiences and you have those relationships. Hopefully. No, definitely not. It's great. You form great relationships. Then there's the other side where there's artists you're probably never going to speak to again. You know, running a business, running a gallery, you know, I'm sure, you know, Toy production, it happens. You know, you're going to meet some people yeah. who just didn't click. Um, could be personality difference, could be just a lack of communication, but it just didn't click. So, but sometimes you run into somebody and you meet them the first time and it's just like instant, like boom. Like I, I saw Snipped in the comments and Snipped, I didn't, I, I know him from Instagram. I never met him. We ended up doing a show and people actually thought we were a crew because it was like as soon as we met him, we clicked. I yeah. unpacked my pieces, he unpacked his pieces, he's from Vegas. And people thought we actually collaborated on each other's pieces. And now, like, if I go to Vegas, I make sure to, like, check in, you know. Um, That's awesome. That's great. And I love that. that. Never met him in my life prior. It was just all Instagram and, you know, snip That's the homies. wonderful. That's so rare and, and great when you meet someone that you click with that hard. Yeah. So I was supposed to do something with him. I know he's probably mad at me. About a year and a half ago, he was. <laughs> he's probably mad at you. He's going to come in the comments and be like, I'm still mad at you. <laughs> so now you're on the West Coast. How did that happen? How did you go from Florida to California? Yeah. I'm going to answer that, but I just realized Barb's in the comment and she just, she's oh. in the other room. She wrote, definitely learned how to buff a wall at Redefined. So many paint layers on that wall. Right. right, 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 right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, imagine having your wife painting and buffing a wall at like two in the morning. So that's what she means. Yeah. Yes. Um, Me you, and Barb. Bob, we can relate to these situations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Getting to California, I was actually, so I, I work, I do work in fashion, um, you know, retail side of it, the styling side of it, the networking side of it. Um, and I was working out in Orlando for a brand and Italian brand, very high in fashion house. When I say high end, uh, you're probably not going to get a pair of sneakers under 500 bucks. Uh, the average suit is probably going to hit you for about maybe 2,500 to three grand. So high in fashion house. Um, they wanted to kind of elevate me just a little bit. So offered me uh, a new location they were opening in California. I, Orlando, I love the art scene, don't get me wrong. But as a person from New York, it's extremely boring. From a person from New York that is used to that. So right. I was ready to go. And my job knew that I was ready to go. So they called me and I I thought I was in trouble because of what we missed out the client or something like that, but it wasn't the case. I was like, Oh, I'm relieved. They said, Hey, we're going to open up a new location. Do you want to come help open it? It means you're going to probably have to move. And I literally said, if it's a city, yes. They said, do you care where it's at? I said, is it a city? And they were like, yes, yeah, a city. So I said, where? And they said, San Francisco. And I was like, yeah, I'm good. Move me. <laughs> and they were like, I was like, nah, I've never been there. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so they were like, well, are you answering in a couple of seconds if you've never been there? And I was like, well, I'm from a city. I'm bored of Orlando. I'm ready to go. 
So they go, hang up, call Barb and ask her. So I call yeah. her. I was like, hey, they just offered to move me to San Francisco. Do you want to go? She was like, hang up and say, yeah. So I hung up. I called back. I was like, yeah. She said, yeah. So, uh, you know, they paid for everything. They paid for, you know, the cars to get there, the animals to get there, all the artwork, whether it's my artwork or art that I collected, paid for all of it to be shipped, uh, you know, gave me like the 30 day housing, um, opened up, you know, location out here, been successful since. And I don't regret the move. I absolutely love it out here. And it's not San Francisco. It's out closer to the East Bay, closer to the Tri-Valley, which is about maybe 45 minutes away from San Francisco. But I absolutely love it out here. That's Do not awesome. So Bob is an immigration lawyer, right? No. So she's a paralegal. She does. She just took the oh. bar exam, though. She's had a law degree for I don't know what seven years or something like that. Six, uh, seven years maybe. Um, she's a immigration paralegal. She did take the California bar recently, so she's waiting on the results. Um, oh, she's from Brazil. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, she's from so, Brazil, but she helps me with everything. Did she already have a career at that point, or she was? <laughs> so yes, this is where it kind of got a little bit difficult. Um, yeah, she was ready with a. She wasn't with a firm over there, but she represented, I believe it was like a Brazilian businessman who owned properties and she was still under contract. So she couldn't move when I moved. Now, keep in mind, Barbara and me have been together. She can correct me if I'm wrong. She should be in the comments. I think she 17 will. years. She I want to say 17 years. Um, okay. let's I want to hear seven. from Bob. I want to hear from Bob. She has no <laughs> idea. There's times that I'm like, happy anniversary. She's like, it's our anniversary. Um, <laughs> so I want to say 17 years. Um, she was still on the contract of what she was doing. So we were actually living, uh, her in Orlando, me uh, in the Bay Area for about a year separately. So, of course, many phone calls, me flying over there, uh, her coming a couple of times more, so me flying over there. Um, and then after the year and the contract finished, uh, she actually did the long drive with her parents um, from Orlando to California with two dogs um, in a Mini Cooper. Uh, so they did it. You know, the parents, I think, rented a little van, but she drove with the cat and the dog in a Mini Cooper from Orlando to uh, California. Wow. So I'm, glad, I'm glad I wasn't wow. part of that. The Mini Cooper, dude. What the fuck? Like? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I don't a know how she did that. Cooper. Not an old Mini Cooper, right? Yeah, I know, but it's still a go-kart, isn't it? It's a fucking it go-kart, man. <laughs> it is. It's not built for California. I'll say that. It's not built for California. The The hills... And the ground tore up that Mini Cooper in like probably two years. Oh, so we, had, we had to get rid of it, tore that thing apart. Um, wow. So yeah, so, she uh, she was still on the contract out in Florida. Uh, you know, she had to finish what she was doing and then she took the drive and she's been here ever since. And just like me, she she really likes it out here. That's crazy. We've talked about a lot of stuff. Oh yeah? What are you talking about now? No, I wanted to ask about your artwork. Your oh, artwork. Yes, like we, your like artwork. we're kind of like talking about yeah. all this Awesome, cool Lots of stuff. other artists. It's and true. I know that we've interviewed you before when we were on network. So true. we've sort of had the conversation, but we've never had it here now. That, Tell that us. like a 15 minute interview that was super quick that I was talking like I had like 27 coffees. Yeah, no, and it <laughs> was, it was, it was fun. And, and we, I know we really, I felt like we actually really talked because I learned a lot that night. Yeah. Um, tell us, you know, kind of what you're up to, what your inspirations are. Like, what do you, you know, if you're familiar with your, I think a lot of people are very familiar with your work, but you know, uh, we can go back. We can talk. I feel like we've sp talked about the presidents and the imagery. We should, we, we, should, should, start we yes. should start over. We should start over. So people, tell us about some of your base influences. Where, right, where, so where, you, where are you going? I know I keep referring to the comments and like going off rail. There's no, a, in, in the comments, this is Luis Reyes. I've been friends with Lewis since kindergarten. And, and he that says you've never is, cursed. That's actually you've never true. cursed. Like, that's funny. Can you but say fuck true. for us right now? <laughs> Can you break the, the, the law? <laughs> I don't like, you know, I remember when we were probably like 10 years old, like he almost took the life out of me. He got me in like the headlock trying to get me to curse. And instead I opted to almost pass out. I don't even know. Oh. What, <laughs> what, well, do you, what do you, what do you attribute that to? I don't know. Because my father curses like a pirate. Now, my mother never really cursed around me. Um, yeah. And my grandparents, I grew up in my grandparents' house. They never really cursed around me. My father curses like a pirate. And obviously, growing up in New York, everybody's cursing. Um, and how do you feel that. when you hear that? I'm sorry? How do you feel when you hear, like, the curse words? Is it, oh, I don't is, care about it. It doesn't bother me. It's just not part of my vocabulary. Okay. Oh, I got it. Yeah, it's not. You know, Method Man made a good point. It's like that offends you, dude. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm fucking... <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm an interesting, like, I, I wouldn't want to say I'm an interesting person. I would say I'm an odd person in the fact, like, I don't curse. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Like, I don't even drink a beer. I don't really eat, you know, often. Like, you notice that if there's ever artists or a bunch of group that's going to eat, I usually skip the dinner. Um, I don't eat. It, it's it's weird. Like, I, you know, I live off of, like, I pizza. And, like, I eat like a five-year-old. Uh, I eat, like, pizza and chicken fingers. Um, so there's a lot of things I don't do, and I don't know oh. why. Bob so. says she curses oh. enough for both of you. Yes, yeah, she does. I have to stop her in front of Onyx sometimes. <laughs> oh, but, yes, cool. yeah, that happens. Chicken so, uh, parm, no sauce. That's my that's my <laughs> thing. That's like the fanciest I get. Chicken parm sandwich and no sauce. Chicken parm, no sauce. Don't you want that lubricant, man? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was a try. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, can I get one of them dry chicken parm sandwiches? All right, that's cool, Peter. Yeah, no. that's cool. I remember I got mad. Somebody called me the Will Smith for art. I was tight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, but not love. Uh, so the president's the iconic figures. I'm sure anybody who's seen an interview with me knows kind of about it. But for those that don't, um, again, that was a joke that started that kind of ran. I used to do like these uh, silhouette characters, all black with like crazy hair. Did well. People liked it. Um, didn't really move too many pieces when it came to like galleries and stuff. But murals, they look cool though. Um, and then I was in an art show, it's called the B-Side Artist Art Show. And B-Side Artist was a group of collective, like it was a collective in North Florida. And my homie, uh, Lemus, German Lemus, um, it's funny, he's trying to get in touch with his uh, his Spanish roots, Hispanic roots, and now he's like, Hedeman Lemus, so I make fun of him all the time. But uh, German Lemus, that's what he always went by. And we would always kind of like bicker and argue, but as friends. And in this show, you know, he was just like, I'm gonna come in first because there was a first, second, third prize. And there was probably like 13, 14 artists. And he was like, I'm gonna come in first. And I was like, all right. And uh, I think he had made like a joke that like we were stealing like his style. And he's a traditional painter. He's a traditional painter, but he will paste like a little, like just thing on the side, like let's say a historical, like, I don't know, like photograph. And uh, like, for instance, if he paints Malcolm X, he'll have a picture of Malcolm X pasted on the side, very small. And uh, I was doing a lot of wheat paste at that time. So the night before I did a piece and it was just a fun, funny piece. And it was George Washington with a paint roller sitting down. And on the top, it said, I fathered your whole style. And uh, George Washington was considered, you know, a forefather. And yeah. I just put it there to see if he would get it. And uh he ended up coming in first. I came in second, but my piece sold first in the whole show. So <laughs> I kind of felt like we both won. Yeah. But yeah. then everybody was coming up to me about that piece. So then I started just doing just different versions of it. And then I went into Lincoln and then I went into Ben Franklin. And a lot of it started as a joke, but then people started collecting it. Like I would get, in fact, last night I got an email from somebody who bought a piece from me 10 years ago at Baltimore Comic Con asking me if they can do something with it. Like, so people really started collecting it and enjoying it. And like, this is a person I haven't spoke to in literally in 10 years. I got a random email. I'm like, damn, people like really like these characters. And then out of nowhere, like the controversy started coming with like their actual historical backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. So then, you know, obviously me growing older and understanding like the feeling behind it uh, and pretty much the meaning that their faces bring, I started playing with the imagery a little bit um, where kind of making it a dual reference, like, money is something we all need. We can't deny that. Like as much as you can hate these historical figures, you probably have some in the bank or in your wallet or at home somewhere. But it doesn't mean that we always have to like promote the imagery as like the most positive thing on earth. So a lot of times I do try to make it a little bit darker, a little bit uh, edgy, um, sometimes contradictory. And then I started just doing more pieces like that, like saying, okay, this is a piece that we're all familiar, a face that we're all familiar with. We all, not that we worshiped, but that we all kind of looked up to at one point in our lives, but we also understand there's a duality. There's going to be something off about that. You know, like I, I know I've used the Statue of Liberty a few times. Um, Benjamin Franklin's a reoccurring one. Uh, Lincoln's a reoccurring one, which that seems to be a fan favorite, the Lincoln one. Um, but, but I always make sure that I know for every positive there's a negative, and I try to balance that in the artwork. So I do get people that they're just like, oh, I, I love it because of money. And I'm like, okay. And then we get people like, you know, you know who you're using, right? You know his historical like significance or what he's done, right? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And that's a duality behind the piece. You know, it's letting right. you kind of decide uh, why you're collecting it. And you can decide why you're collecting it, but understand that there is another side to it that you're going to be reminded of every time you look at it. 
Yeah. That's cool, man. It, 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 it's good that you like delved into it. Like you're not naive around the imagery around it. Do you know what I mean? So it's cool that it's got like, it has stories. It kind of reminds me, like I love your work, dude. Honestly, I fucking love your work. <laughs> it reminds me of like some old, like, like some of the old Monty Python animations. Do you know what I mean? When they'd be like, Arr. they'd put yeah, the like, yeah, yeah. iconic figures in and they'd be like the weird eyes going, oh, fuck you. Do you know what I mean? And like, yeah, yeah. like, I love it, man. It's wicked. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like when there's conversation behind the piece. Like if you look at a piece and you look at it three months from now because you own it and you find something else and then all of a sudden you have a question about that, like I'm fine answering it. Um, and I like when that happens because that shows me that it's not a shallow piece. Nothing wrong with shallow work. Some things just look cool and you own it to look cool. But like something that you can go back and look at like four years later and find something. And it might be something you don't agree with, you know, it might be something you will agree with, but that's the whole point of, you know, purchasing, I would say my art is understanding that it's not a hundred percent on one side or the other. Like it's probably going to push you a little bit into thinking a little bit harder. As yeah, simple as conversation well. that can be had around it. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely conversation, you know. Yeah. It's like the, the big piece behind me, you know. I had this, I think, at the Myris Gallery out in San Francisco. And I had a lot of people come up to me specifically because of the title. It was called The Traveling Man. And, you know, I think with the, it, it's over, I forgot, I think it's close to like 500 stamps, individual stamps behind it on a woodcut. But people were like, you know what Traveling Man is? And I was like, yeah, I so, said, you know, it has to do, you know, with the history of the Masons. And I was like, well, I think a lot of people don't realize that there, along with the negativity of the Masons, there's also some positivity with the Masons. And that forces you to do your homework and understand it. That's not for me to explain mm -hmm. to you because I'm not an expert. But I like to do things where it forces people to really go, okay, let me do my research before I purchase this or after I purchase it, you know, yeah. and knowing what I get into. So yeah. I have a question with your with the mixed media usage of, uh, of, of your pieces. Like we have one here that's like a, has like a postal tube attached to it. And... Uh, so uh, do you think about this kind of like messaging like before you create the piece or are you like, yo, I have a all these stamps, so I'm gonna throw this in the background? I use, uh, so color scheme is what I play with first. And then from the color scheme, I'll eventually go into a concept. Um, me being into fashion and sneakers and stuff like that, I usually have something that I'll look at and I'll be like, I'm gonna do something based on that color scheme. And then from there, uh, you know, look at it. Like maybe there was a day that I was wearing a Penny Hardaway blue jersey and I was like, I wanna do something blue, white and black or blue, white, and then throw in some red. And then I start doing something. And for instance, the one with the poster tube, you know, if you look at that, there's a lot of blue. I don't use a lot of blue in my work. Mm -hmm. And it was probably just something like that. And then I'm like, oh, these are starting to look like postal colors. And then after that, now the concept clicks. Oh, if I put this here, that would look cool. Damn, but if I put that there, I think it'll be cooler to have something vintage to go along with it. Let me find and source this vintage poster tube that probably doesn't exist. Oh man, I'm gonna make this poster to be part of it. Oh, maybe let me get some uh, kind of just chains to kind of go along with it. So it kind of just it snowballs. It snowballs from a color theory uh, to a concept to like a finished piece. Um, it does take a while for a finished piece to get done, especially one that big, because I'm sourcing things to go along with it. You know, a lot of it is not just gonna be like the actual design, but it's gonna be the things that go with the design to kind of make it go together. Um, think about it like in fashion, you know, you, you do have your main pieces, but you also need your accessories to bring the outfit together, you know, and it's the same thing with those pieces. You know, if you look at it, it might have a vintage dollar bill, it might have something vintage, but it's the accessories that bring the story together. Absolutely. So. Do you find that you follow color trends then in your art? You say if you start with a color palette, do you, fo do you follow the fashion trends of the season when you're creating them? Sometimes I do, or I follow what currently I'm into. Like, I know there was a, for a little while, I was doing a lot of like beige and taupe, um, but I was into Fear of God for a bit, uh, which is a, a clothing line. And they use a lot of beige, taupe, white. So I was using that for a bit. Um, and then sometimes I'll just straight up make a piece based on what I'm owning or what I'm wearing as far as like the clothing. You know, I believe I showed the swatches uh, last time. I think on network I had showed the yes. swatches. Yeah, um, they were awesome. Yeah, it was like something like this where it was straight up like, it was a color swatch, yeah. but it was like the Supreme one and it was called Supreme Drip. And, you know, so sometimes I'm just going off of that little practice pieces and ends up turning into like a whole piece. Um, it's like a real you know, blending of your day job and your art life. It like blends it all together. It's yeah, crazy. definitely. Like my what I'm doing at work, definitely when I come back, I'm just like, oh, I need to I should incorporate this because not that I'm an expert at that, but I'm educated in that and I don't know how to manipulate it into 
kind of this world since they are two separate, completely different yeah. worlds. Do they ever look at your artwork in your day job? They do. Uh, again, I'm gonna, it keeps time back to you guys. Um, <laughs> the first time people from the company I work for ever seen my art was, yeah. I think it was the Chris RWK and Friends show. Yeah. Where one of the US directors and a GM from New York showed up and they were like, yeah. I had no idea you did this. Yeah, and they were like, and then I found out that the director started showing people in my corporate who was showing people like their colleagues and it kind of snowballed. I think one of the GMs out in New York actually bought one of the pieces from the, from, uh, from you guys. And that was the first time they seen it. And then later on, I met somebody who's in the visual department. They flew in and we were having coffee and out of nowhere, they were just like, hey, I saw your artwork. And I'm like, what? And they were like, yeah, they were like, so-and-so has showed me on the computer. So I was like, oh, damn. So it's getting out there. So they know. Yeah. Yeah. But, do you, yeah, uh, no, no. Does it make you uncomfortable when they see it? Did at first, I did you it feel for like years. it's to, two yeah. totally different things? Yeah, no, I hit it for years. Like, you know, it's because at my first at, at my job, I'm very like, you know, I, I try to stay sharp, try to stay kind of like, I'm, I'm always me. I'm always like this, but I'm also a little bit reserved. Sure. Oh, but there's the first time them seeing me like in an actual light, like, hey, people are here to see the artwork of this person. Right. So at first I was just like, oh man, like, you know, people from like my job are here and like people at a high level at my job. So, you know, you don't know how they're yeah. going to see you the way people are reacting to you as an artist and not as an employee. Right. Um, I, I, I would scary. think a best case situation would be to start to have them ask you to incorporate your, your work. work. Into what will you do? Is, is that something you'd be interested in or no? Of course he'd be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> Who so would yes. that? Yes, but again, like the, the brands that I work for, the brand that I work for, it's, I, I won't say it's traditional, but it's very, uh, they, they considered it timeless. So there's not a lot of yeah. imagery. It's more so the fabrication, uh, the hand construction, yeah. like a lot of things are sewn by hand, uh, some machine, but a lot of it's sewn by hand. Like when they're using like cashmere and wools, it's like the first coat that the animal is born with. So they shave it during the winter time. So the, an I mean, I mean, during the summertime, so the animal can breathe. Um, so they're, they're dealing with fine fabrics. I think imagery is not a lot of what they do. Um, right. You know, if they ever wanted to do it, then great. Um, but I, I don't think it's something that- it's Stylistically not part of their world. Yeah, it's not part of their world, right. you know? Um, that this doesn't mean that I, I'm not into fashion or want to do anything like, you know, I think recently I've been starting to try to make my own pieces to eventually release a collection. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind yeah. of my question is, is the next step for you in fashion or is the next step for you in gallery work? I think it's definitely fashion. You know, I think the gallery work and the fashion are going to go hand in hand. Um, you know, creating a, a piece that, you know, like for me, I, I personally don't like, and this is nothing against any anybody that does this, but when people are like painting on shirts and stuff like that, that's not for me. That's very kind of like to me, early to mid two thousands, it can still be cool if done right. It's just not for yeah. me. I think in the the field that I work in, it's about the production quality, it's about the finished product, the wearability, um, and the many ways you can wear it. The many ways you can wear it. You know, like a t shirt is pretty much limited, but when you start creating pieces that you can wear with dress trousers or joggers or a blazer over, it kind of like. I don't know, it enhances what you're making. So that's why I think it's taken a long time for me because I don't want to just print the shirt. You know, I, I have done samples already and some of the samples I love, some of the samples I absolutely hate. Um, you know, like today I'm wearing a sample, like it's just the sample that I have, um, but it's not something ready to release. Like for me, I would need the image a little smaller, a little bit to the right. So I have samples, um, but it's not just like a t-shirt. You know, it, it's definitely hoodies that are cut and sew, dyed differently, takes a while and gets expensive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah. So, and then I think the other struggle that I have with it was initially when I started it, I wanted it to just be aligned with not much of my imagery in it. But then I realized whenever I tell people, they go, oh, so what image is going to be on it? So then I'm just like, ah, oh, so I don't want to do a print per se. But then I was like, maybe I can have just a little piece of something there um, on yeah. it. So you'll, you'll see like small pieces, but it's not going to dominate the actual article of clothing. I mean, you've made shirts before, and you sent some to us, and, and yeah. your shirt is my one of my most favorites. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I love it. The shirts so do well. The shirts do well. I think for me, I'm just kind of, 
you know, I think, I don't know if you hear my cat crying, but that's my cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, locked behind, it's locked behind a door. That's why it's like nosy. Oh, yeah, we did that whole show. Clap was just like, Clyde, there was like a cat in. This away. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, I'm afraid if I open that door, it's going to jump on here. No, but yeah. like the shirts do well. Um, and every time I release a shirt, if it's uh, pre-produced, it sells out. If it's pre-order, it does really well. Um, so that that's not really the issue, the support on the shirts, because they always sell. I think for me is I kind of feel like I've done that for so long, over 10 years, that yeah. now it's the next thing for me. Because if I've been producing T-shirts for 10 years and I still don't have like a clothing line, to me, that's an it, it's an issue if that's my end goal. It means I've been doing something right. for 10 years and it's never really lived up to what it was supposed to be. So the, the support behind it and the sales are not what... I don't know, it's affecting my next step. It's more so that I want it to be done right. Like I want the cuts to be raw when they're cutting the materials. I want the dye to like really sink in. Um, so less t-shirts and more like pieces, like, you know, like a hoodie that is like completely yeah. hand dyed and cut and stuff like that. So it'll take a little oh, bit of fashion. It yeah. sounds like you're about to explode into a whole new creative space. Yeah, I'm trying, that'll be nice, that'll be nice. You know, I think I, I keep buying sneakers and then uh, I take the inspiration from the sneakers. <laughs> Yeah. So. Somebody asks if you have any inspiration from the Grateful Dead. I says yes, it's because you're from the Bay Area, but you're not from the Bay Area. You live in the Bay Area. But do you I'll have be honest, any Grateful I don't Dead? About the Gra I, mean, I know who the Grateful Dead obviously are. Yeah. I can't name you one song behind it. No, you know, again, if it's not hip hop, it's not that I don't listen to it and I don't like it because I can listen to it. Like I mean, if you throw on you know, Metallica, Sepultura, some of the things in the car, I'm perfectly fine. You know, Soundgarden, I'm perfectly fine listening to it, but I probably can't name you more than a handful of songs. It's not something that's consistently in my playlist. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. But I see a lot of the Grateful Dead stuff out in the Bay Area, but yeah. just not for me. Yeah, it's a different world. There was a pretty uh, cool pair of sneakers, Grateful Dead Dunks. I don't have them, but they're cool. They released a Grateful Dead figure today. They did, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a big topic. I, to I don't understand the Grateful Dead. It's not my vibe, so I don't get it. Sorry. Moran was never high as a teenager in America. No. So <laughs> that's kind of when it comes to the last season. Season was like, fuck this conversation. Like, Grateful Dead. No. Yeah. He's like, I'm not talking about fashion. fashion. <laughs> His battery probably died. That, that's always my fear, though, when I start talking about the fashion stuff, like people that are not in fashion might get bored. And it's the other way around. When I'm in the fashion part of my world and I start speaking about art, they're like just looking at me like I'm insane. Like we stood in this really nice hotel out of New York and, you know, they pay for everything. But it was funny. It's like this really nice hotel. And as soon as I went outside, there was a night owl sticker. So I'm like telling everybody like, oh, that's night owl. Like he's from Oakland and he does these dope owls and they're looking at me like I'm insane. <laughs> and then we were in Brooklyn. I saw a Matt Siren, and I was with one of the directors. And I'm like, "Oh, that's Matt Siren. He's super dope." And da, 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 da. and uh, so you know, you kind of never want to lose that audience, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's time for us to do Toy Tank. If Prime's around, oh, Prime's, here he Prime's is. been there here he for is. a while. He yeah, we're good. And we're we good love to go. Prime, but we. But well, we, where's CZ? And, and I, Take CZ and make sure yeah, it's okay, I, and that exactly. his house didn't blow up. Sneakers are a great representation of hip hop and really influence a lot in our scene. They do. Sneakers is, yeah. They are. It's in hip hop and art. Like, you know, I, I think they've influenced a lot of songs, obviously. I think in art, they influence me all the time. Like, I have like a, and I try to get like sneakers that I know are pretty out there. So it's not going to be a basic sneaker that's going to kind of inspire well, me. I, I, there is I, definitely I, a trans. What? What? Well, I, was, I wanted to ask if kind of, so, you know, we wind up playing in worlds where we cross over into this kind of stuff and we're not experts right. in sneakers. No. So I sort of, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but it's a question that's been on my mind. Do they last? Yeah. Are they a worthwhile investment when people spend all that money? For, yeah, no, but I hear that box. they just break down. That even if you like keep them, unless you keep them in like, oh, he's back. He's back. Unless, I don't <laughs> know why I'm asking that question. Every day so went that, up. On. That's a yes and a no. If you're buying them for investment, then understand that like let's say a pair of nike nothing wrong with nike um but the soles are probably going to fall apart after a while no matter how pristine you you keep them and in fact some people argue it's better to wear your sneakers because they'll last longer because we keep them unworn you'll have the foam cracking and then falling apart um that's you know for me that's, that's exactly what i've heard recently i didn't know that 
That's now it doesn't mean it's not worth it. It breaks because, down after a while on its own. Oh yeah, it'll pop. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's worth it. It's worth anything because there's a lot of people that are buying them not to wear them. You know, they're buying them to showcase them. Um, so you know, you, you get a pair of you know, just really old like, you know, sneakers. They might be worth something to the right person. Um, but there's people that argue wear your sneakers, let them get beat up because then you'll have them. You know, 15 years from now and you're still wearing them. Whereas if you kind of just keep it on ice for 15 years and then you wear them. That soul's probably going to come off by the time you walk to the car. Um, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I know my brother had gifted me some uh, a pair of pennies one time, and I uh, a huge Penny Hardaway fan, and I decided not to really wear them. And then I started wearing them little by little, and then pretty much the back just went bloop. And like while I was walking, it just kind of like came off, and I was like, oh, there's that. I probably should have worn them more. Um, oh. What I find is I know a lot of people don't like designer sneakers. One, the price point is high. And two, they feel like they go out of style. But that's why I buy pieces that I like for me and not for the hype. Um, they yeah. tend to last longer because they use a lot of really, really high end, like quality um, pieces. Not like, again, I'm not going out there buying thousand dollar sneakers or anything like that. But, you know, you can get a nice collaboration, like, you know, between Converse and Rick Owens, sure. uh, you know, a pair of Xenia sneakers that are really nice. You know, you, you can get something out there that will probably cost the same as the Jordans and they'll last you as long as you need, need them to last. You know, if I, I've had sneakers for nine years now, 10 years that look great. And people are like, oh, where did you get those? And I'm like, I got them 10 years ago. And it's just the quality and the construction behind it will last you. So if you're looking for investment, meaning resale, then yeah, it's probably going to be a, a nice, you know, Nike or Jordan. If you're looking for investment as far as like wearability and longevity, then look at something that is made with better materials, made in Italy, something that, yeah, you spent a little bit more, but 10 years later, you're still wearing them and they look good. They don't look cooked. Right. So. That's interesting. We're going to have to run all our fashion purchases past you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if you're, and if you're buying something for inspiration, get something that's completely out there that nobody else has. Right yeah. like, I mean, someone you know, said in the we, chat where the collection of like sneakers and toys does translate, like it, it does cross. But you know, yeah, we're course. always trying to find what what goes together for five points. Like, what can we bring in to enhance the the uh, experience of being a five points? And the the trouble is, is that they do connect, but only at the highest hypest levels. Yeah. So it's like you know, it's it's trying to find those other areas too. Right? You know, it's good yeah. at that uh, zero productivity. Like Zero Pro, like Zero, Zero Pro is really good at that. Like he has pieces that definitely merges the two, um, yeah. you know, especially on, I would probably say, uh, recognizability. Like he uses yeah. brands that people know, even if they don't wear it. Um, so Zero Pro does a really good job at that. That would actually be a cool show. Like, you know, having the uh, artists that kind of dabble in that world, you know, do something and kind of connect because that's the other thing, like that person that collects streetwear, like they're not afraid to go out and support. Like they'll they'll yeah. line up with something. Yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. All right. Thank you. You're not going anywhere. Don't but go. it's time Don't for go. Alex to sing. It's time <laughs> yeah. for us to bring on Prime. And the yeah. Are so, you guys ready for some toy tank? Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. There it is. Toy oh, tank. Toy tank. Oh, you're not big enough. Toy tank. And show me your fucking toys. Oh my god, yo, I'm uh, excited about this. Like typically Toy Tank is a time when we're gonna like show an up and coming artist and they're gonna display the toy. But you know, fuck that this week, because we are bringing you your friend, our friend, Professor X himself. Please welcome Prime. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? See, we were talking about names before, and you have one of the best names. As oh, a real name. You do. Uh, exactly. Look, I'm still stuck on that nope. song, you know, because that shit was, <laughs> was dope. <laughs> that one you know was actually mean? catchy enough that I can remember it. Look, oh, nice. if we could find somebody to record that shit, right, and mix it really well with, like, a beat, yo, it could be fire, man. That's what okay. we're going to do. Right. We can do I'll that. Go, we I'll know go, people. Yeah, I'll go with you. <laughs> we know people that can do that. Oh, yeah, you wearing a chimichanga yeah. shirt? Yeah, you know, chimichangas and tacos, bro. Oh, that's, that's a dead cool shirt. Okay. That's All what right. I eat during the, the pandemic, you know what I mean? That's yeah, awesome. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, you know. So, <laughs> what, what, what you going to show doing? So, you know, um, I have a couple of things. Um, you know, I mean, we go, we go, you know, back in terms of making some toys, you know, so... 
usually toy tanks for new people, but it's also for anybody that has something new to show. So, so yeah, so yes. Prime is well versed in yes. making toys and designing and artwork. Yes. And he's been here for not just five minutes, but yes. a while. Yes. So you're here to show us what you have that's new. Yeah. And that's good to make it's that brand clear. New. That's good. On Quarter yes. Magazine Live. Brand new. So, um, this is Soul Breaker. Oh, nice. Right? Um, cool. This just released with Tenacious Toys at New York Comic Con. Um, awesome. So, I like the packaging too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's like so cool. And it comes with a little sword. You know what I mean? Awesome. Nice. Very little nice. Accessory. Um, can you so hold the toy that. up? Can you hold the toy up to the screen for oh. us for a minute? And turn it around. And, yeah, there you go. Down, there, oh, yeah, closer, closer, closer. Down. Closer, closer, closer. There you go. Cool. And then can you spin it around for us so we can look at it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that thing is tell so. About, tell us about, yeah, this, tell us about figure. this figure. Um, Who is this guy? So, well, his name's Soul Breaker. Um, mm -hmm. He, uh, I'll take him away. Keep him here. Yeah. So his Thank name you. is Soul Breaker. It's just something I had doodled for fun, and and we had thought that it would um, look cool in the 3D space. Yeah. So you know, we went for it, and then we we spent like a year like trying to come up with different colorways and and stuff like that. And um, you know, people seem to really like it. You know, um, the hands Articulate. move, the legs move. Nice. Um, Does the so, head twist? The first thing I would do if I was holding that no. toy is I would hit the head I and I would twist. move the arms. Okay, so the the head does not twist. Um, okay, but okay. the arms, but the arms move and and the legs move. Nice. So and, if and you, can I ask if you a question? Yeah, it's go ahead. really dope. I love the colors. I love the face. My question is, how much is the face sculpted? I see it's sculpted like around the cheekbones. So uh, I don't know where the heck is my. Is this? I think my iPad is upside down. That's why. Um, uh, okay. So it's sculpted. Got, yeah. So it's like a mask or whatever, yeah. and then um, so this is the only part that's um that's flat. Okay. So then the Art Deco. So then the Art Deco is is placed on top of that. Very Let's cool. See if I can... It's a great looking figure. So you've got a lot of space for flexibility there for changing the what the face looks like. Yeah, I wanted to leave it like that just because, um, you know, in case anybody wanted to customize it or um, in, in case we wanted to come up with some different, um, like, colorways, then we have a little bit more flexibility on what we could do on the front of the face. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. You know, great idea. Um, That's beautiful. So can people so, buy that from Tenacious Toys now? Yep, there's only, there's only a few left. Um, because awesome. Benny did really well with these at New York Comic Con. Um, is that the first colorway? No, this is our, our third colorway. Um, okay, because we, we have the OG colorway. Oh, oh, okay. oh nice. that. there you go, very cool. Now you can see the sculpting yeah. on that one, yeah, 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 yeah. So, is, there, is the, the chin OG... a different sculpt, or is that just it's the deco? Same. It's a different color, okay. No, yeah. the, 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 the chin is sculpted also. Okay, cool. Um, so this one is available. Toys. There's a few available on strangecattoys.com. Um, Can you produce those with Strange Cat? Yes. This this colorway yeah. is available at um, Invasion Toys. Nice. Very cool. Corey's their saying own, their own personal. Give us a sneak what peek was... of the one for Decon. Oh, okay. Yes, do that. Yeah, Show us. Yeah. Making news here tonight. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, so we have the Boba. Oh, nice. We all can recognize this Yes, we know what that one. is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For decon. You know. Nice. Right, cool. So that should be that, that should be really is that exciting. A booth? Do they have a booth at decon? Is that where that one's yep. dropping? Yeah. We we have a we have, we do have a booth at decon. Awesome. I don't. I uh. Don't have the number. I That's okay. You, you can. That's okay. I will tell you the number, but I don't remember. Uh, That's okay. This little guy is releasing tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, 
Very nice. Chris R. W. K., my uncle's favorite. Is it really um, booth one, two, three, four, Corey? Corey, or you that just was the best that booth number of if, all yeah, time. If you did, then you looked at it. it. And I would think no. that Prime <laughs> should be able to remember that number. <laughs> Bro, you you know what? He he hit me up earlier and he said, oh, the booth number is this. And I'm like, it it's sounded mine. like a joke, so I didn't pay attention to it. You know? <laughs> we all think um, that's good, Corey, because that's, that's too good. Best. Yeah. That's too good. Maybe uh, it is. The Ramones well, My group. uncle's favorite by... Uh, this is the colorway that I did for uh, for this Chris R W K figure. This releases tomorrow. That's amazing. Um, on Strange that Cat, figure was way Strange bigger Cat toys. than I thought it was. Seeing yeah. it in your hand like that, it's way bigger. Oh, it's awesome. yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. Nice. I love that Harlequin uh, cat too. The so, so it uh, yeah. has a little Harley Quinn cat. Nice. On top. <laughs> Wicked. And then, um, and then I put a Joker bird on his hand. That's so good. I love it. What time does that drop? Uh, Do we know? Usually, it's like twelve o'clock. All right, Eastern time. <laughs> <What is that? laughs> Around twelve o'clock. I'm sure Corey can pop in yeah. and tell. <laughs> Around twelve o'clock Eastern time. Something. You can you can find it on 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 Corey's page. Um, it should have all the details on Chris R W K S page. It should have all the details. And correct. last one to show is uh, this little grandpa cat. Cool. This is my last toy to show today. Um, okay. This is a, a production between, well, it's a it's a strange cat toy production, but I designed the figure. Um, nice. That's strange cat logo? Is, yes, I redesigned his, his entire... Uh, Love it. Well, I redesigned his entire website. So, uh, so this is the cat that that I came up with based on on a cat that Corey used to have um, many many years ago. That became the logo Aww. of his store. Mm-hmm. So I, I, resi- awesome. I redesigned it to make it look, you know, cuter. What um, was the cat called? Hey, George. Grandpa cat. Grandpa cat. Oh. Grandpa cat. You know. So That's this good. should be releasing in the next couple of weeks. Oh, That's right. Cool. That's Lots right. of super yeah. sweet kids. Wow, dude. This is yeah. great. Thank you. Thank so, you. So, Peter, do you think that you'd be able to, like, fucking knock me out one of these uh, these Soul Breaker jackets? Because that thing is dope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. let's bring it together, guys, because that hey. thing is so fucking hot. It even has like I I designed like a little patch to put on the arm of every single one. It's basically like a lotus a lotus flower, but it has a skull. Like the bottom of the lotus flower is a skull, or whatever. I was going to ask you the lotus flower. What? Nice. How do you come up with the color schemes? Um, just basically based on things that I like that I personally like. You know what I mean? Um, what was the inspiration for the to... OG colorway of the Soul Breaker? So the o- the OG colorway, um, the color scheme. The reason. So, I really just enjoy like the pink, the reds, you know, the kind of neon colors with the yeah. teals and stuff. Um, these are just colors that I grab, you know, gravitate to, um, and. When I designed it, this is exactly what it looked like. Um, Very cool. It wasn't you, really like. It's usually it's usually like. I like it, and hopefully other people like it too. That's the best way so, to do it. That's why you well, should yeah, buy toys because you, you don't want to make you don't want to make anything that you personally wouldn't buy. Right. Know? Exactly. Hundred percent. Right. So I know you've like yeah. you say you've doodled it. Really, you've illustrated it really well do you know what i mean um so is there any what why did you do it like what's who is he so tell me your story man so this was um this was during the pandemic um you know so i had i had a lot of free time because you know my job shut down and stuff um i started looking at a lot of like cyberpunk stuff i started watching a lot of videos on uh, Cyberpunk uh, 2077 and stuff like that, which is a video game. 
Um, yeah. It's glitchy as fuck. I love it. <laughs> and and you know, it kind of just took off from there. You know, he went he went through a lot of iterations before we like before I decided on the final final um, like product or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So very cool. Thank you. Panda in the city asks, "Have you made blanks of these?" Not yet, but um, soon. That's hopefully in the plans. Wow. Um, I'd like. I would like <laughs> to uh, make blanks and then possibly do a show and see what other colorways uh, people can create. Or, you know, I love that. That's a really good way to see. That's what we like to do. That too. It's great to see what people yeah, can come up with. Yeah. Yeah. I I would love to see you know people get creative and and really knock it out of the park. You know. Yeah. 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 It's a very cool figure. Yeah, I'd love to do oh, it. Thank you. I'd love to. Yeah. It's great. He's, 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 he's like, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know I got you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got you. Well. Thank you so much for coming and showing us. You can check, you can buy the new colorway at booth one, two, two three, three, four, four. <laughs> which is ridiculous at Decon. I don't know how at you manage that. Yeah. That's wild. And check out the purple one that just released in New York Comic Con. If you want to snag one of those real quick, yeah. get over to Tenacious Toys. Yep. Yep. We had on last week. And show. I will. So um, shout out to Benny. I will be. I will be at Decon uh, That's running awesome. Corey's Corey's booth. So if you happen to purchase one and you need it signed. I'm right there Look to do that. it. That's rad. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Right. Cool. Thank you. Yay. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you for coming on. We're going to you know we love you, bro. Yeah. Stay safe. You can stay and hang out with us while we wrap this up. This is falling down. Um, All right. Peter, I have a question for you. I yes. saw on the social medias that you ran into our friend Travi McCoy at an airport. I saw that too, right? I yeah. did. It was super random. So... First, I love his album, the Never Slept Better album. It's really good, right? <laughs> that is such a yeah. good album. I think I listened it's to so it like fucking 300 times about the vinyl and everything. Yeah, yeah the, it's so the, good. Uh, Barbara says I pronounce it wrong all the time. Like, she speaks French, I don't, but Deja Fate or something like that. I probably heard that song like 2,000 times already. Because, um, you know, it has to do with uh, kind of creating trends and then people kind of forgetting about you, mm -hmm. not realizing that you're still a leader because they're all copying you still like so that that just i, I love that song um we had, we had a funny moment with travi like that we were oh, yeah, hanging that's true. out that's true and somebody a, a summertime deck party which yeah, we do in the summertime hanging so on our deck we, we went late <laughs> enough that travi appeared yeah because you have to be like yeah it has to be like after one o'clock i mean he's like and he shows <laughs> up and, smoke. and somebody was like we were just listening to music together we're all hanging out and someone's like, oh, you know what song I really love? And I don't remember what song he said. It was like TV on the radio? Some, something. Some big, like, yeah. Some big hit. And Travis like, yo, motherfucker. <laughs> like, I wrote that song. And they're like, what? Yeah. And then Travis just like, sings the whole, sing thing. The whole yeah. song. He's like, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was no so shit. Weird. So, I fucking so you it. just bumped yeah, into him randomly. I was in New York and uh, I was flying. And I had like a last minute flight back home. So I couldn't find anything at that time to go straight, uh, straight back to San Fran. So it stopped in um, somewhere in the Midwest. I forgot where it was. It was somewhere in the Midwest. We ended up stopping. And uh, I was literally like I had my headphones on like probably five minutes prior listening to the album. And I, I went, I got Starbucks. I'm there looking like a jerk in the airport with like sunglasses on at nighttime, looking like I'm a celebrity, <laughs> like I'm not at anybody. I'm just there with sunglasses on, my head down, cats crying again, sorry about that. Yeah. So somebody walks up to me and they're just like, yo, Pete. And I look up and I'm like, <laughs> yo, Trev. So it was crazy. I was literally just listening to, to, to your album. I met him and his manager there. And uh, you know, he, he said he has a couple of my pieces that he got from you guys uh, yeah. already. So just running into him like that, was was odd because yeah just there sunglasses on my hair was looking crazy because you know airport hair was all in my face and like, oh, Yo, Pete. And i'm like oh Trav, what's up <laughs> maybe that's one of the ways that you make him appear no it's yeah yeah you, you got like, album with sunglasses on in an airport there. after midnight and he's, he appears like a genius. i'm like who yeah. knows my name you know i'm in an airport you and smell I'm like, the julie 
And you're like, yo, I think Travis is about to appear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and, and it was great. So we took we Travis, no, I'm not, I'm no, no disrespect. You know I love you. If Travis was here, he would lean down all the way and kiss me on the forehead and be like, you little baby Kimber. That sounds, that's, yeah, that, that definitely sounds like a, the him. And then, you know, obviously he makes me look tiny because I'm already short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was like, it's funny. I have like two pictures with him, like just in general. And I just look so small next to him. <laughs> oh, well, I'll do, I'll stand, like, four I think everybody him. looks small after him, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a giant. Cause I have a picture, I have a picture with him and his, his elbow is on top of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's every photo. I'm like, bro, I'm really short, you know. Yeah, Yeah. that's like a him him and Van Dyke. Van Dyke is another one. He's six seven. Like he picked me up like a baby before, and like I never show that picture. I look like a shark. (laughs) Dalek too. Dalek's like twelve foot tall. Uh, Twelve foot. Brian is height blind. Yeah, no, I think yeah, he's six seven or six nine, eight. But yeah, anyway, so I run into him, and then you know, super cool. And I don't really take a lot of pictures of people, but I was just like, Barb's not gonna, you know, believe that I ran into you because we're always listening. So I said, let me get a quick pic and I'll send it to Barbara. And right away, Onyx saw it. And Onyx calls him the Halloween man because of the Love Me, La- uh, Love Me Back to Life video where he's a zombie. So yeah. Onyx calls him the Halloween man. So he's like, Halloween man saw daddy. Did he bite daddy? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, that they were picking up from the airport. So I think it was like a couple of days later, uh, I had told Trav that like Onyx sings uh, Love Me Back to Life all the time. And we went in the car, he started singing, so I started recording him. And he did the growl, which he's never done the growl during the song. So I sent that to Trav. It was hilarious. Um, <laughs> and I posted it. But yeah, yeah. Onyx likes uh, like uh, just maybe like five MCs, and Trav happens to be one of them. That's good. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. I think it's like him, like Run the Jewels, Toby and Nigue. Like it's a very eclectic, like just group of MCs that Onyx yeah. likes. Well, he's resonating with the influences you're giving him. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah he was listening yeah. to like his favorite was like Shaka Khan when he was like two. So <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's yeah. So my last question, unless you guys have anything else to ask, is what advice you would give to a new up and coming artist? Actually, someone asked slash... that in the chat. Oh, they did. Yeah, someone. Oh. If you scroll back so like an hour, sense. someone asked. What advice would you give to an up and coming graffiti artist? Okay, so and in the city, so gym class heroes, yes, gym class heroes, yes, yes, yeah. So, so Pete, what I'm I'm calling you, Pete. There you go. Oh, there you go. What advice your best tip for new aspiring artists? Yeah. So, what advice would you give to a new artist? Um, I would say that I've not to offend anybody, but I've t- told this to people that were starting their own thing. Like, it's okay to get a reference from another artist, but don't blatantly copy their style. Like, I've had people ask me, like, hey, what do you think about this? I remember one kid, like, I mean, and he's a super dope artist now, but I, and I won't say who it is, but he asked, and I was like, oh, it's good. It's just that if I want that style, I'll book woes, you know, Angry Robots. And it was literally like pandas. Um, So I was like, it's okay to reference somebody and to pick pieces of their style, but don't copy it blatantly. Like, if you're trying to get out there, because that means there's going to be somebody that already mastered that style above you. And if the gallery or curator or somebody trying to collaborate has access to that person, you're always going to get skipped over because, you know, you'll be the B version of that artist. Right. Um, right. You know, that, that's one thing that I, I used to tell people all the time when they used to ask, they stopped asking. I don't know if it's because I was kind of brutally honest with that. Um, you know, really yeah, sometimes you have to be, you know, yeah. and then also letting the, the, Curators, gallery, uh, you know, gallery partners, uh, other artists know what's not your expertise. You know, I think a lot of people just go, oh, yeah, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And then you get there and you're like, damn, I can't do this or I don't know the proper materials. And so that's why I'm honest. Like, I think even with you, you know, with, with you guys, I told you, I said, when it comes to the toy space, I'm not really educated in it. So I make sure to let you guys know that prior so you can kind of lead me in that direction or just tell me if I did something that's straight wrong because it's something that I'm still learning. So yeah, educate yourself, be honest with the people you're working with and definitely take references, but don't like copy or don't try to become the next one of that person. Like be yourself, be your, you know. I, I like that I can, I'm not the best artist and I know I'm never the best artist in a gallery, but if you walk in, you can probably walk straight to my piece and know who did it. You know, so yeah. that, that's something that I always tell people, like whether you're going to be a curator, have your own style. If you're going to be an artist, have your own style. If you're going to be a gallery owner, have your own style. There you go. Fantastic that's advice. That's good advice right there. That's good words, man. Honestly, that's good. That's good words. Yeah, I'm into it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, no, I oh. learned that the hard way. When I, I did a show with Tobar one time and somebody called my work Tobar's and somebody called Tobar's work mine. And uh, that was back when I was doing the silhouettes and he was doing silhouettes of people in gas mask. And we realized we do a lot of shows together and our work was very similar. And we never really worked with each other in the same studio, but we were in almost every show together. And I was like, yeah, something has to change. So he went a completely different route. I went a completely different route. And now you can walk in and find our work in the same gallery, but it looks like two different artists versus people calling my work his and his work mine. But were you intentionally, you weren't intentionally copying each other. You just- No, no, we never even worked with each other in the same studio. It was just, right. my thing was I always had long hair. At one point it was longer and I had dreads. So I made sure to do a lot of characters with crazy hair, but it was just all in black. Like there was no features. Right. And with him, it was always in a suit, all black, no features and a gas mask all in black. So I guess people just saw two black silhouettes in the same art gallery and yeah. either thought, because of the way I dress, you know, with the suit and everything that that would be me. And then the other one would be him. And then eventually they would just say, all of it is my work, or all of it is his work. So right. I, I think we both had to find our own voice and working with another artist, like being best friends with them, hanging out with them, that could be good for inspiration. Just make sure not to copy each other too much or get influenced too much. Cause we weren't blatantly copying, but I think us just always being together, like things rub off and then you can't yeah. tell whose work is whose. Um, and that, that's a recipe for a disaster. It's very rare that two people blow up at the same time with the same style. Um, usually it's going to be one or the other, or somebody's going to sell a piece for, you know, a grand, the other one's going to sell it for a hundred bucks. And then there's going to be some bickering in that. Find your own style, find your own price point, find your own collector, like do your own thing, take inspiration from people. That's, that's not an issue at all, but definitely make it yours. 100% Doldrin said also. Study design, carry a sketchbook, and look at art every day. So Words to live by. Words to live by, exactly. Well, Very thank true. you, Peter. Thank you, Prime, for coming on and, and doing this with us today. Thank you for everybody in the chat. This was awesome. Please like and subscribe to us because um, YouTube likes that, and they give us perks like being able to unlock things. Yeah, and growing the channel. Yeah, that so would be nice. And then Keep we can get you, like, you're going to get that like, cool like, little plaque, you know? Yeah, yeah, you, you know, yeah. We want a plaque. We get get us a plaque, people. Yeah, we want the plaque. <laughs> That's and, like a uh, hundred thousand views. Oh my god! If gosh. you have any questions that you want us to talk about on the show, email info at clutter toys. Yeah, anybody we'll you want to see on the show, yeah, or if you want to so, if you want to take part in Toy Tank, fill in the application form online. We have a link in our bio on um, on Instagram and on YouTube. So yeah. Check out these wonderful artists on Instagram. In Prime We Trust and Peter Van Flores, CZ13, Maya Tanaka, Clutter Magazine. And join us again next week where we'll be on Friday, not Thursday, because we'll be joined by the one and only James Groman. So that will be a good oh, one. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank cool. you. Have a good thank week. You. We'll catch you all.